ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, this is our second day, and uh, today I must say that I'm so much happy because uh, we have this pleasure uh, of uh, receiving our regional minister, uh, Professor Jose Carlos Gomez Villamandos. He's uh, the regional minister of the universities for the research and innovation uh, in the Junta of the Andalusia. Um, he makes uh, this honor to address our conference here. It is very important um, to have him here. It is very important that the Junta is aware uh, what Life uh, is doing and what kind of progress is available to the local authorities, but also to the Kingdom of Spain. Uh, Professor uh, Gomez Villamandos uh, is uh, a professor, full professor in the uh, Department of the Comparative Anatomy and uh, the uh, Pathological Anatomy in the University of Cordoba. He has been a director of the university and he has been also uh, the chair of uh, the conferences of directors uh, of the universities for quite a while. So, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much, President Christos. Good morning and welcome to Andalusia and welcome to Sevilla. Thank you, uh, Professor Abadri, for your presentation and invitation to participate in the Ready International Conference. I would like to highlight, first of all, the privilege of Andalusia to hold the first European scientific research infrastructure that is located in Spain, and whose objective is to watch over our planet seven day, and knowledge from institutions, corporations, university, technology center, and entity for many parts of the world to respond to global problem. Andalusia has our own determined to take this great challenge. On the one hand, it is one of the regions with the greatest biodiversity of the European continent, and the other, it has an ecosystem of first rate knowledge agent with personal and infrastructure that can develop research and projects in many pioneering cases. For the Andalusia government, accelerating the green revolution has been one of the priorities from the outset. Our it is urgent to intensify the fight against climate change and the committee to our environmental sustainable model. In this sense, from the regional minister of university research and innovation, we have allocated 8 million euros to university, technology center, public research organization, and company to find solutions to the drought. 90 initiatives have already been presented and are in the selection progress. Likewise, through the complementary biodiversity plan, we have made 6 million euros for the grant ability to university and research center to develop initiatives that promote the adaptation of natural system to climate change and mitigate its effects. But in addition to this specific support for researchers, it is essential to have cutting edge scientific infrastructure, as is the case of Light Wars Eric, in which the Junta de Andalucía participate with 50% of the contribution made by our country, by Spain, as well as other unique facilities with which our region is exponentially increasing its technology excellence in areas as a cleaner and more sustainable fusion energy. Encouraging the development of research projects related to the discarbonization of industry and transport through renewable, affordable and abundant energy essential to produce green hydrogen. Our life is in the Sevilla and the Cartuja Science and Technology Park which we support through the public purchase of innovation and whose objective is to develop a city model in an open digital decarbonized and sustainable ecosystem on the island of La Carta. I would like to conclude by highlighting the Committee for Speed Government to Research and Innovation, fundamental area for progress as we begin. To this end, we will allocate more than 780 million euros of purely funds in the coming year with the aims to continue to research, innovation, and knowledge transfer projects 
in a strategic file to continue advancing in the rehabilitation and competitive of the regional economy. Thank you very much for your attention and welcome again to Sevilla, to Andalusia. Thank you. Okay, now it's um, time for the first part of the session major threats uh, to the health, biodiversity and ecosystem health. Um, I would appreciate if um, the speakers uh, can join here to the table. Um, Monse, uh, Miguel Angel Collado, um, Daniel Crespo, um, Cristiana Dimuri. Um, to try to, to, to keep the, the timing of, um, of the session um, at the appreciative. Um, the speakers um, can keep the, the timing of the presentation uh, to around 12 uh, minutes. I will inform when a few minutes is uh, left. And then um, we will have some time for, for um, short um, questions. Um, the idea is uh, well to start with with um, Christos Arbanidis, uh, but uh, he's now with the, the with the main uh, authorities. Um, I think we have here. start with um, with Montserrat Lila, uh, Direction of Frequency of Invasive Plant Species. Yeah. Do you mind? <laughs> yeah. And if you want to speak uh, from here? Or? Okay, good morning. Um, so my presentation is a part of the work that has been conducted within the LifeWatch project somehow. And the main objective is to produce a database on the ecological impacts of invasive plant species in Europe. So we have organized the work, uh, well, all these impacts uh, through their impact on the level of an organization, whether the impact is on species, on communities, or on systems. We also um, have introduced information on the, uh, on the native taxa that is impacted, being microbes, plants, or animals. And also we have classified them by their uh, trophic level as the composers, herbivores, omnivores, parasites, plant pollinators and predators. 
And in terms of ecosystem properties, we have classified the impacts on carbon nitrogen um, in the soil, the composition rates, pH, nutrient pools, nutrient fluxes, resource availability, soil minerals, soil organic matter, uh, soil salinity. So all the information has been um, gathered from the scientific uh, papers from the primary literature from the EC web. Um, and the selection has been that the study has to be a field study in semi-natural or natural ecosystems. And that it has to simultaneously compare invaded and non-invaded sites by a particular invasive species. So this is uh, the number of uh, studies. Altogether, uh, we found uh, 287 publications that uh, record uh, more than 4,000 impacts on more than 100 species in very European countries. So here you see uh, the exponential increase of published studies and also invasive species studies. So most of the studies um, look at the impact on species and followed by the impact on communities and then on ecosystems. So the impact on ecosystems are uh, less studied but have increased a lot in the last years. And in terms of the impact on native species, most of the impacts are, are on other plants and um, lately there are study, more studies on the impact on parasites and omnivores and symbionts. <coughs> well, the most studied countries are um, the ones in Central Europe and there is a lack of studies in Eastern countries. In terms of the habitat studies, well, uh, it's too small, but uh, most studies are in temperate and boreal uh, habitats followed by um, temperate grasslands, Mediterranean and coastal areas. And one third, Well, one third of the studies are on five species, which are these ones Reunion uh, japonica, Invadins grandulifera, Solidago gigantea, Kerkuzura, and Provinia selvatacea. So, um, these studies have been studied in many uh, countries and still they are. So, there is an exponential uh, increase of studies on these only five steep, uh, species. So, in terms of the direction of the impacts and the frequency, 44% of the entries show significant impacts, with more decreases than increases on these response variable, variables. But a decrease doesn't mean a negative effect, and an increase doesn't mean a positive effect. So this is only the significant, uh, statistical significant effect. So this information might allow to, for instance, compare the frequency of the increases among levels of ecological complexity. Here we see that usually uh, there is more frequency of increased impacts for ecosystem response variables than for species and communities, while the negative, well, no, I should say, decreased impacts are more uh, commonly found here for impacts on species and communities than on ecosystems. Um, also, there are differences on the direction, uh, whether the impacted species is an animal, a, a microbe, or a plant. And well, the, the outcome of this um, research is that we, we are going to provide the first database, uh, the first um, information system on the scientific-based um, 
evidence of the ecological impacts of, uh, invasive plants for a continent, and this information we think that it's of interest not only for academia but also for management and policy purposes. Indeed, uh, we have used this information we have provided to IPES on the global assessment on invasive species, and also it can be used for um, building and well having more impact assessments. Um, as the A cut for UCN. Thank you. And uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Villa, for this. Uh, don't worry. For this. Um, um, for showing, sharing with us this comprehensive uh, study. It's really good to, to, to see uh, this kind of studies in which you are able to integrate all the information from from previous um, research work. Um, is there any question in the room? Yes, sir. What it is? Thank you, Moshe. Uh, it's not a question. It's a, it's a very simple and very natural uh, comment. How we can help you as an English Thank you. <laughs> I think that uh, so far, this database lasts till the last year. So we have to finish. But there is an exponential increase on in number of studies. So we cannot update the, the update if we don't have people working on that. So it would be interesting to keep updating the, this information. And IPES will be very uh, interested on that. Yeah. We are going to release the first uh, version, operational version of our light block system which is built on, uh, on blockchain technology, and I think that there is a lot of space there. Uh, if you give us uh, the right tags, uh, so the system can go and, and, and uh, crawl automatically and can bring uh, the kind of information you presented and can update it you know, regularly at the intervals you would like or you would be interested, or your community would be interested in. Thank you, and, and, and I think this is a very easy work to do. I mean, it's not complicated. Yeah. Uh, Kuhnland, University of Bayern, Germany. So my question is: Is the database focused on continental Europe or political <laughs> Europe? So does it include islands? Um, includes islands, yes, like the Canary Islands, Madeira, Madeira, yes. Mm -hmm. It also includes uh, yeah, the East, East, Eastern countries, which uh, sometimes politically you don't know whether they are Asia or Europe, yes. So I was wondering, there must also be studies that focus on mitigation of the effects or eradication of the invasive species that are present as well. And I think for the, for the policy and management, uh, we need effective measures. So this is, is this also going to help to, to design mitigation measures? Well, um, some of these, st these studies are observational and some are removal experiments. So we could extract information. I wonder whether we have it, but we could. We could. Um, yeah, mention how the study was conducted. So if it's a removal, it can give information on that, yeah. But it's not quantitative, huh? I mean, it's not, uh, it's, you cannot do a meta-analysis on that because we have not extract the, we have not quantified the impact. It's only about counting at this point. Thank you, John Mabier from the Institute of Marine Science. Uh, Complementary what Crystal was mentioned, I think that it would be really interesting to think about in an early warning system in the future, you know, because I think that the uh, the invasive species, when they are highly extended, it's much more expensive and much more difficult. So having this idea of identifying in those areas in which is early, you know, stage, which is much easier to, to remove, I think it would be a good service for the future. Yes, I mean, the, yeah, the database can be 
complement it with more information. Yes, of course. Uh, hi, I am Maria Luisa Antequera from the University of Malaga. I would like to know if you uh, plan to publish as an open access and if you plan to connect with additional database, uh, for example, with the tax ID or something like that. Yes, definitely. Uh, 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 yes, we were indeed working on publishing the database open access. Yeah. Indeed, we first. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> we're working on that. I mean, before the, by the end of the project, it will be published. And you will connect with an additional database that is already open? Mm, no. <laughs> no. Okay. No, no. But it would be, I mean, anybody could do it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is an Excel file. It's not anything sophisticated <laughs> with code or with anything. So it's a, a very simple file. Okay, thanks. Um, we need to move to the next speaker. Thanks, um, Monse, for the presentation. Um, Christos, if. Uh, <laughs> so, we have another? Yeah. Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, what uh, we're going to present uh, today is not only the VRA that we have uh, developed for uh, the non indigenous invasive species as uh, part of our core project, that is uh, how we, we are working in order to federate it with the EU's uh, uh, infrastructure, the EU's platform, and that, uh, that's uh, quite a lot of, uh, of effort that has to be. Uh, that has to be spent in the area. Well, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to present, you know, a, a diverse uh, team uh, which is coming from, uh, from uh, uh, many uh, research centers but also uh, universities and, uh, and other research infrastructures such as the EPRC, such as BLIS, our uh, representative from, uh, from uh, Life of Consume, etc. Uh, this is uh, a collaboration between the Embry Fair and the EUSC Life uh, uh, Science Clusters uh, within the EUSC. Uh, EUSC is the uh, European Open Science Cloud. And uh, I'm going straight uh, to the what. What is that? What is this uh, workflow? What is this VRA? Well, uh, our contribution to the EUSC is based on a science project, uh, which is built in order to contribute towards the estimation of the impacts of the non-indigenous species. It's not only the impact, but it's uh, also you know, what we need, what kind of information we need before we have uh, an idea about the impact. And the first, of course, step is to be able to discover the uh, non-indigenous invasive species. Let's call them NIS. And um, towards this direction, uh, it is very important to note here that uh, this is uh, based on the ARMS observation system, which is used by the BRC, Eric, and uh, the ARMS is the autonomous uh, um, uh, reef monitoring system. So that's the kind of uh, workflow we, uh, we present today. Why we took uh, this decision, why we started uh, this uh, internal project, etc. First of all, because the users will be able to discover the non-indigenous invasive species uh, or taxa in their area of interest. Then, uh, once they have uh, the, the list, uh, they can also have uh, the distribution, uh, either in the country or in the European waters, so they can have uh, different distribution patterns. Uh, so um, they can uh, uh, compare those patterns e either among the countries or uh, among uh, the two different approaches we take in this uh, uh, VRA. And of course, it's, uh, the final thing is to provide early uh, suggestions, early um, um, managerial suggestions to the environmental managers and therefore they can take uh, some, some measures. And of course, uh, well, this, this infrastructure can, can be expanded towards uh, uh, addressing more complex problems here. And uh, 
uh, the problem that uh, it, will, it will solve is uh, the early discovery of the NIS, the potential alterations of the uh, native and non-native, let's say, European habitats and, uh, and uh, the, the taxa that uh, are there at their, and their um, ecosystem services. Uh, it's also linked uh, with the uh, socio-economic uh, issues and therefore it can be also linked with the uh, issues like circular economies, jobs, etc. How we started? We started like this. This is the conventional community analysis thread uh, uh, or approach, if you like. And uh, this is the meta metabarcoding community analysis. So we set up two teams. The first team was the scientists and the second team were the computer or software engineers. Uh, we identified the steps of uh, uh, the research uh, towards uh, testing the hypothesis, which here is the uh, discovery and also the, the patterns, or the distribution patterns. And on the other side here, we put together all the web services that were available and were able to carry out those steps. And we did the same thing exactly here. Here we have the, the scientific steps and there are the web services. Uh, here is a concrete, uh, let's say, machinery that has been developed uh, and it's called PEMA. And uh, finally, uh, what we're trying to do is to collect the patterns and compare them. And that's very important because uh, um, the two approaches, they give us a, a hint more. Uh, some of the taxa can be early discovered by visual uh, uh, observations, some others, they can only be discovered very early uh, by the metabolic approach. So it is very important for us to, to, to find another way and compare those patterns. Uh, how does it work now? Uh, the user has to go uh, to the workflows webpage of Ligoteric and uh, there are many ways to, to be authenticated, to, to be given an access and uh, this is what we're trying to do right now with uh, EOS. We are trying to federate our AI system with, uh, with those uh, that exist already in EOS, and therefore the user will be able to access this VRE through EOS and not only through Lightbox. But I will come back to this in a minute. <clears throat> then the user has an access to this uh, VRE. Uh, it's uh, actually two workflows, as I said uh, before. Uh, here at this step are the files that are inserted into the system and therefore those are the files with the data that have been collected uh, with, the, with the application and the observation through ARMS and uh, some, oops, excuse me, some processing at this time uh, on the metabar coding and uh, also uh, this is where the first uh, um, global database is called up because at some point uh, the, the, there is the need also to identify uh, the taxa that we have, you know, as sequences. Uh, this is on the other side the second, uh, which is the um, uh, WIRS, the, the global uh, database on the uh, marine invasive species uh, developed by, by VLEES. And uh, here is the world, the world register of marine species, and that's for the identification of the taxa uh, through this uh, database, so we can have uh, an identity for each of the taxa identified as, as, uh, as a sequence. And then uh, there's the process of the data and uh, the production of the files. And in the next step, what they do, uh, what the workflow does is creating two uh, files, one with the factor, the environmental factors, or they can be socioeconomic factors, and one with the species, uh, species distribution patterns. And then uh, we have with this uh, final set of web services the, the final results, uh, which is the comparison between uh, the two patterns. So this is how it works right now. Okay. And then why we have to federate with viewers? Because there are very many advantages there. Uh, for example, from EOS, uh, we can have access to scientific projects by communities from multiple disciplines. And then uh, there is the potential for our web services, our uh, workflows to be used by other communities which are coming from different disciplines, but also from different domains even. And uh, we can have uh, the opportunity to collaborate with multiple domains, uh, with the other science clusters, and finally the production of the synthetic knowledge. What is that? 
That means simply that we go and try to test the same kind of hypothesis with multiple uh, uh, types of data, with multiple approaches, like here, for example, the conventional community analysis, but also the metabolic coding community analysis. And what do we give to use? Uh, it's, of course, uh, all the DRE, all the web services, the workflows, the community that is uh, being uh, involved in there, uh, which is going to be engaged uh, pretty soon, as soon as we have the AAI, etc. And uh, we have thought that um, there might be also a quite wide range of uh, interested groups, starting from, of course, the students, the academicians, the researchers, all the way to the policymakers and the citizen scientists. And uh, our next step is uh, to complete the integration with your services. Uh, we're talking about core services like AAI, accounting, monitoring, evaluation, etc., etc. This is not that we don't have our core services indoors in LIDOS area, but this needs to be uh, federated with the EOSC system and be able to uh, uh, be accessed from, from their platform. And then, of course, to engage uh, the relevant communities. We have already a plan for the engagement of the communities. We have already a plan for the sustainability uh, of this. And uh, uh, finally, we need to publish the results and repeat the same process with other DRAs or other workflows. And that's all. I hope that we are within the time frame. Thank you so much. On behalf of the authors of, of, this, um, of this effort. Thanks, uh, Dr. Arvanitidis, uh, for this uh, showing how uh, the workflow uh, shows the results that we can get and how we can take advantage of um, the work done for uh, some, some, some years with a really nice uh, team. Um, any question uh, from the audience? Yes, please. Um, ben Kisevaj, the University of Amsterdam. Um, I've seen a wide range of uh, potential targets of who are going to be using the DRE, uh, from academics to policymakers. How do you envision the usage of the DRE and therefore the customization, for example, as well? I can imagine that a politician would not want to alter much of the DRE itself, but an academic perhaps might. How would this work? It does work like a researcher who uh, makes the exploration and has the data and, and has the knowledge how to use the system, uh, can get the knowledge out of the system and then can give uh, a, a qualified, let's say, information to the, to the politician, for example. So, um, after multiple, for, for instance, approaches and, and uh, uh, multiple ways to, to explore the capabilities of this workflow, they may come up, you know, with a kind of pattern and they say, well, if you want, you know, to uh, uh, mitigate the results, uh, you should do, you know, this and that and that because the pattern goes to that direction or to the other direction. Uh, but that's only a first approximation. <laughs> there might be others. Any other uh, question? I was wondering that I think it's very clear the process and, and the knowledge uh, of the people that you know analyze that data. Uh, but I was wondering about the data producers, you know, the ones that provide the data. You, you mentioned that it's based on blockchain. Could you or not, uh, the system? Or, or I was wondering up to which point you know the people that provide the original data has been you know acknowledged at the end when you produce, for example, a map of or whatever. And, well, just if you could comment on uh, First of all, blockchain is a cross-cutting, uh, uh, let's say, part component of the infrastructure, okay? Um, well, we, we run this workflow with the type of data that I was referring to, but it's open, you know, for any kind of data that are coming either from uh, observations, visual observations, or metabar coding, or anything else, perhaps because uh, the, uh, the VRE is a domain of discipline agnostic. So, from that point, uh, I think that uh, since the blockchain is the, the, the central component of our infrastructure, well, one of the central uh, components, 
that each time a user uploads data or he registers herself or himself, uh, he, he is tagged you know, by, by the system and the system follows the activity. And therefore, if a data set is uploaded, uh, uh, from that point on, uh, uh, it gets you know, a, a, an ID and uh, through this ID it is, is, uh, is followed you know, and it's used and it's uh, downloads and it's uh, views, you know, uh, or even, you know, later on, this publication uh, can be traced by the system, and therefore the system uh, gives back uh, to the uh, to the user or to the producer uh, the the available information. But uh, uh, Joaquin López Lerida is uh, my colleague, and uh, he may he may give uh, some additional information. Only only to complement this, that is more or less like that. But what we did uh, with data is that every user has the possibility of uploading data to the to the blockchain system, and then the blockchain system is another repository for the for any uh, people research environment for any application. Once he has uh, done all the he has applied on the all the people research environment and has obtained results, he can say the, the data also to the blockchain system and have full traceability of all the operation once it has obtained a, a result that a result that, that he or she likes. Uh, the blockchain system is something like a notary and in fact we are elaborating the, the persistent identifier using the hashing that the blockchain system uh, provides us in order to maintain all the traceability during all the time. That more or less that is the, uh, what we do with it. Okay. Something like a final, I think, uh, to advertise a little bit uh, the last developments. Not only that, but uh, even if a, an outsider user tries to um, interrogate the system and tries you know, to find some kind of data, uh, and uh, this type of data, um, they, they can be included in, in her or his search, then the data can be retrieved as well. We're doing this as a prototype for the bicycle project, which is mostly on taxonomy, and, and therefore we engage in the, in, in the live block uh, the, the global aggregators such as the GB, the office, uh, DNA, etc., etc. So the user not only has access to the data, to the data, to the metadata files, but he retrieves the, the, the data values themselves. themselves. Therefore, that's an additional, uh, let's say, um, advantage for uh, for the user if he uploads the data. Thanks, uh, Christos. Um, we need to move on to the next uh, speaker. Now um, it's time um, for the talk about developing computational models for exotic invasive species, tools for prevention, control, and decision making, making by uh, Miguel Angel Collado from the uh, University of Sydney. Thanks. Uh, hello, I'm Miguel Calvallada, and here representing the Natural Computation Group in the University of Seville. And we are here in the. I don't know if this thing has the laser. Okay. Sorry. Uh, we are in the Threats and Challenges to Biodiversity section of the of the Congress, and I want to um, start um, describing some of the threats that are currently attacking biodiversity, like habitat loss, fragmentation, uh, transformation, prevention, pollution, and I want to focus on uh, invasive species, but I'm not talking about, I'm not going to talk about invasive species, we have a lot of invasive species, uh, and they are especially dangerous in the Guadalquivir Basin. However, I want to uh, focus on how to uh, attack this problem. Um, if, we want, if we want a solution for these kind of problems that in biodiversity, uh, we first need to understand our systems. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, abort the problem if we, don't, if we don't understand what's happening. So what we usually do in science, I mean, is to do some uh, modeling 
He represents you uh, um, like a basic human mediated invasion. Uh, model. A model is a, a simplification of reality to understand things. And uh, what is a good model? A good model needs to be explicative. Therefore, if your model cannot explain a bit of reality, it, does, it doesn't make any sense to, to exist. Uh, a model should be uh, predicted. This way, this will help us to make better decisions and thinking about management and attacking this problem of invasive species. And a model could be also flexible. I mean, if your model can be transposed to different systems and different species, it's going to be like the, the perfect thing. However, though, do perfect models exist? I, I don't think so, but we can discuss it in another moment. What, um, uh, what, what I want to talk here now is that uh, ecology, and me as an ecologist, I'm, I agree with this, ecology has focused mostly on processes and not in the specific numbers. Therefore, ecological models, at least in the traditional way, are mostly explicative and not predictive. Ecology is good for explaining things, but not to predict things. This is mostly because uh, realistic uh, uh, models, predicting models, need like a lot of data and a lot of computational data and a lot of uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, I'm here to present you these computational patterns, patterns and these kind of models that we do in the natural computation group. I want to show you the P systems. These systems are the models based on memory computing. This is the computational paradigm. This is a computational paradigm that has uh, mostly three, three things like uh, membranes, which are the compartments in which objects uh, evolve and follow some rules in order to, to evolve the system. The, the object can get in the double membranes and can increase the amount, can decrease the amount. And, you can't really do like whatever you want with this computational paradigm. Based, based on this, uh, we have these systems that are uh, these models based on memory computing that are highly efficient because they can work in parallel. They are modular, so you can add or extract things. This is like a, a good advantage because you can uh, work step by step and you can see what's working and what is not working. However, the bad thing about this is that you need a lot of data and proper, proper data to validate your models and to do the proper uh, predictions and the proper simulations. So, uh, I want to show you a prototype of our work we did like last year. We wanted to model a Dresena polymorph like the, the infamous Serra muscle. And we did a collaboration with the Confederation Geographical Wagiri. They gave us uh, some data. Uh, they did a really good job uh, sampling all the Wagiri bus in a lot of water bodies, channels, rivers, dams, like you have the list right, right here. These were like very promising, but at, at the end, uh, this data was not useful for us because they uh, focused on occurrences of what's happening, on where is the cellular muscle, but not on monitoring, not on the, the evolution of the, the disappearance of uh, apparition of the, the muscles. Therefore, what we wanted to have and we wanted to do is to have like a, this, uh, this pattern, a uh, population dynamic, and to, once you have this, you can ask yourself things and you can simulate what happens if you take different decisions, like what will happen if we remove uh, half of the adults, or what will happen if we increase the output of the water in the dam in a specific month. So, uh, this is the data we could extract. We only have the like, concentration for, for larvae. We have no adult data. Uh, the adult data were mostly uh, absence or, or 
not, and only for three years. But uh, we were motivated and we tried to do a model and I'll show you the prototype. And the thing I want to show you is how this system works and maybe create uh, many plant a seed or interest in you about this kind of models. Okay. So, this is our prototype of, uh, of the model. This is a uh, B system. You have uh, the three components I told you before the membranes. You have like a one big uh, skin perfectal membrane that contains the whole B system. And you have uh, 12 uh, membranes within that represent each, each month of the year. And then you have like an additional uh, membrane to, to loop the system. Then you have the, the, the objects, you have adults, that is the set, you have larvae here, and then you have an A, which regulates the, the year you are simulating, and then the C that mediates and control of the processes. And then you have some rules, but I'm not, I'm not going to explain, I, I don't have time, but I'm going to show you how the model of the, the system evolved. So, uh, you want to start the system, you uh, increase the the sub index, the sub index of this auxiliary item, and it enters in the, in the first month. Therefore, it mediates, it, it um, gives the order to the rest of the objects to enter in the in the main brain. So you have larvae and adults in January. This is basically it. And they reproduce. You can you get some larvae. And you get some reproduce, already reproduced adults. Then you start the death phase, and once you have passed the death phase, you can re you remove. I mean, you don't do that. The, the system is automatic. But thank you. So the, after the death phase, you remove all the energy from your uh, January main day, and you are ready to to start in the second month, and then you go all the year long and you loop the system. Therefore, this is like very simple, but it's really, really complex. And as I said before, you need a lot of data, you need a lot of uh, probabilities, like the probability for an adult to die, the probability for a lobby to die, the probability for an adult to reproduce each month, and also, and the, this is the, the most important thing, the, the population, the multiplicity of larvae, adults have, uh, what amount of adults and larvae we have. So in the output, we, we ask the model, it will give, you a, it will give us a specific number. So, I'm almost finished here. I think this model ha has a lot of potential, um, at least for, for, for an ecologist like me, uh, because I show you, uh, one model with only one compartment for one dam and one species, but you can, if you have the proper data, you can do a, a multi-compartmental uh, system in which you have uh, into account the surface of the dam, the, the depth of the dam, the shore, the door of the dam, and each part of the dam will, will act different. You can do this with prepared data for different dams, and also you can do this, of course, for different species. Therefore, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to report in the web. No, Ah, you do. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, we already have the infrastructure uh, ready to, to be used and to. <coughs> to run um, simulations, but what we really don't have is uh, proper, proper data. We ask a lot of scientists and the administration who the, the response were limited, and therefore I'm, I'm also here uh, in addition to explain what uh, the systems are briefly, to Ask you if you are interested in this kind of system, you have uh, this kind of long monitoring uh, data, uh, please contact us. You can contact me, or, or you can ask Agustin, Luis, and David over there. Um, thank you. That's it.
sometimes uh, me and I personally I love these kind of uh, models that can approach quantitatively to to try to understand what's happening you know, in the in the, in the systems. And sometimes the, the public administration it's they need this kind of information because as you mentioned they probably collect data based on specific protocols or uh, generalities that that doesn't help to 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 specifically predict. No, well, one thing that they usually say is the people who collect the data are not the same people who analyze the data. Yeah, yes. mm -hmm. And there's a mismatch. So, mm -hmm. so. so a science policy dialogue, I think it's very important, trying to not only to translate the research to the policymakers, but also to help uh, to, to, to start from the beginning, you know, just in the data collection, the protocol that they usually do, and try to be more effective. Was not a question. It was just to share. Yeah. Can we do that? Um, sometimes uh, we need more science policy dialogue in these practical ways, you know, as you are proposing. You know, it's difficult, but um, yeah, it's, um, maybe we need some forums like like this. I, mean, I guess everyone's agenda is too busy mm -hmm. to to stay sit for three days. Yeah. Yeah, now some projects are it's, uh, are focused. All the projects are focused on, on dissemination, communications, trying to transmit the, the results of the projects. Now, I think more uh, in, the, in the new projects, it's also focusing on this science policy dialogue, you know, so trying to, to have an impact. On, on yeah, like the divulgation plan that the projects ask you to, to write. With a specific focus, trying to have an impact on policy. So, so um, any question from, from the audience? Thank you so much for the University of Africa. Um, I was wondering about the uh, uh, membrane computing. It, it reminds me of something like cellular automata, but you did notify that it is highly parallelizable and cellular automata often uh, cannot be because they're dependent on each other. So my question is, is, what is the scope of each of these membranes? Are you looking at a single component of the species, for example, a single larvae, or are you looking at a community as a whole? So how much does each of these membranes explain? And why would you want to have multiple of these membranes in your model? Okay. So, so the, the, the model focuses individually and in each uh, individual to, to uh, reproduce the, the, this, I mean, the life history traits of each species. So, of each individual, so you need a lot of parallelization to run every single uh, one of the individuals of the population. We're talking about uh, several muscles, several muscles are like, are, are like this, and the, they are they are like very densely allocated. So you need the parallelization for this, and um, you will need uh, multiple compartments to represent uh, like multiple sections of the ecosystem. Because uh, you will have different, for, for example, a very simple thing. You will have uh, different temperatures in the surface of the dam than in the, in the depths of the dam. So, and a, a larvae, if, if it falls in the depths of the dam, it will die. But in the surface, it will not die. So, you can apply different rules for different compartments and have rules of the, how the individuals of the objects move through the the compartments. You can have, but compartments uh, are, doesn't need to be like a physical representation or something. You can have like a compartment for for auxiliary rules and this. It, it combines like an abstract thing that is very complicated for me as an ecologist, but I, I know that computational scientists are more prone to, to do this abstract thing, because what I think is, at the end, it gets in, intuitive. I don't know if I have so you think so time for the last question from Peter. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I was wondering in what way your approach is different from uh, sort of traditional approaches in ecology that use matrix projections or individual based models. Uh, the advantage of some of them is at least that you can look at sensitivities and that they can give you a clue what are the sensitive parts of the system that, that allow you design more efficient mitigation measures. So is, 
is it a sort of a, a matrix projection model that you that you have integrated here, or is it totally different? Maybe I will pass the microphone to the brains of this thing, but in, in my opinion, uh, the approach is different because you are realistically uh, representing the, the things that are really happening using the, the probabilities that are really happening, not like a principal component analysis or things like that that works in a more abstract, like a, you, you take a lot of variables and find and you want, you want to find patterns, but the other thing that I, uh, is important is the modular aspect. You can start like a really uh, simple model and then you can add uh, in a modular way. Imagine that I, I show you this, but I want to add also immigration and I want to add also immigration. So I get two new membranes and with their own rules that they connect to our main membranes so you can in a modular way uh, to model a whole ecosystem, all the processes that are happening. But I, I don't know if you want to add something? Very good. I'm Luis Valencia, from the research group on natural computing. Yeah, as you mentioned, this mm, the enter into let's say the category of individual way uh, modeling uh, is uh, somehow similar to multi-agent uh, systems uh, in the sense that you have uh, every local interaction model and then you have the overall effect of the system along time but with some computational difference and details at this individual based approach thank you thanks thanks um we have no further presentations and any questions um now we are uh, moving to the next uh, speaker dr francesco de leo from the national research council of italy talking about uh, using operational synergies for the study and integrated management of invasive island species no. I'm improving by diversity oh. conservation. The role of the Red List platform is streaming and uh, stabilizing the Red assessment. Thank you. Good morning. Now, uh, the platform uh, I'm going to present today is the result of the joint effort of several um, group, uh, basically in life of Chitali, uh, IDIV, and um, University Sapienza. Um, Sorry, then. Okay. Reversing uh, the learning trend in biodiversity roles is possible if we plan in the right way conservation measure, but to plan in the right and sustainable way conservation measure <coughs> uh, is to have basically the information concerning distribution of species and their trends. Uh, UCN uh, play an essential role to inform conservation plan, uh, in particular the UCN Red List, uh, as threatened species established in 1964, and compass today more than 150,000 uh, species, uh, not only information concerning their distribution, but also information on their uh, habitat suitability and uh, major threats they, they find. Uh, the list, sorry, um, the statistics in the slide show that the 28% of the SSE species uh, is uh, in a, in the risk of extinction, is near the risk of extinction, and also more than 20% of the most important taxonomic group is in the same situation. Uh, the list benefits of the works of many uh, assessors more than. Um, one uh, fifty hundred probably or more than my only estimation. Uh, if the number of the assessor is big, the number of assessment uh, made every year is huge, from ten to uh, fifteen thousand assessment for year. Uh, all over all the most important taxonomy group basically. Uh, this complex uh, schema give uh, an important uh, and holistic uh, feedback on all uh, the trends of biodiversity across the world. 
obviously uh, in community. A big number of species, um, a big number of species that increase every year, uh, can make a, sure that this match between the necessity of the list and the necessity of the researcher. Uh, this uh, review shows particularly the principal gap uh, in the assessment uh, procedures. Basically, they are being grouped in the free group, uh, mismatch between assessor needs and researcher interest, uh, scarcity of data, lack of data, uh, and lack of uh, necessita necessary skills um, by the assessor to perform several analysis in the, in the right way. Um, the result of uh, this, uh, this gap is that uh, the 18% of assess species correctly have an outdated assessment. Uh, the risk for the future uh, without a streamlined um, assessment uh, strategy uh, is to become a big or, or too old to be used for evaluation on uh, distribution of species. Um, this, uh, this article, the conclusion of this article, represents our starting point to plan our platform. Uh, we design uh, our workflow and share it uh, in uh, five meetings during the last two years um, in a different community of assessors all over the world. Uh, not only with the assessor, but also with the UCM central administration in order to align our platform with the needs of the UCM and improve the quality of our work. Um, Basically, this roadmap is uh, already in progress. Uh, we start uh, in this month of May and during go the next month uh, an extensive test session with more than 50 uh, assessors all over the world. The result is the workflow, uh, you can see in the slides, seven-step workflow. I try to summarize these steps in three groups. The first group concerning all the steps uh, needed to prepare the input um, is important this part of the process because uh, solve part of the problem concerning the lack of data uh, because the user can uh, upload in several ways the input um, basically can update distribution data concerning the extent range of the species uh, of his own data or also can update um, point data or can directly retrieve it from the um, principal database like OBIF or GBIF directly in the platform. Um, can filter data by domain, can filter data by uh, country and prepare the range map needed to uh, run the, the step, the following step. Next group concerns all the steps related to the process. The user can calculate the step of occurrence and then calculate with an overlap with uh, habitat distribution, the area of habitat for the species, the trend in the last 20 years of the area of habitat of the species, and other information concerning uh, human density and the forest cover in the area in which the species of the species and also information related to habitat fragmentation. The last steps, uh, the scope of the platform is not to automatize the assessment, it's only to support the scientist and his uh, expert knowledge that is the basis of uh, a really accurate assessment in the procedures. Then the uh, seven steps uh, require obviously um, an high competence in the knowledge of the species. Uh, the user can all the result from the previous steps uh, are summarized in this uh, area and the user can edit uh, but need to justify all the steps the user uh, do in these uh, this steps. Finally, the user can download the zip file and upload directly on the CIS system, the central system of management data of UCI. And now uh, I want to show you a briefly demo, but I need to When the user are located in the platform, need to go to the assessment panel, uh, can go into 
different direction, reassessment or first assessment for the species that are known in the list. If you decide to go in the direction of this assessment, you need to type the name of the species, say, and go in the next steps. Here, the user um, can decide the different way, as I said previous, to update data uh, on, uh, on the platform, or update the polygon if they have, or uh, creating one by platform point. If decided by the assessment, the user type the name of the species, and automatically come up for informational boxes, generic information on the taxonomic of the species, information the last assessment run from the species, and information on uh, the history assessment uh, or history of assessment of the species. Also, the distribution. The user can use the distribution at the load uh, on red list side, or can change it, update it in different way. Uh, in the next step, you can see uh, the, the, the different way the, um, the user can use to update the information. As an example, if you decide to create a point record, uh, this step is more important in terms of data deficiency problem to solve the data deficiency problem, can directly uh, retrieve the information of, from GBIF or from OBIS, from other species, surely uh, merge all the information and obtain a map that plot all the point with the different uh, geographical uh, interpolation and something like this can uh, go in the direction uh, to the polygon to translate the point in polygon range map. This polygon range map is useful to run the next steps. Uh, the next steps are related to the project, basically. The user can select uh, and filter data and for the main mention, calculate the uh, in the next step, the user can calculate error habitat starting from uh, preferences in habitat, species habitat preference and elevation preferences. All the bar uh, evaluated in these steps are um, summarized in the last steps. Calculate the trend in the habitat uh, between 1922-2020. Fragmentation of habitat for the species. Information related to mapping forest cover and change in mapping forest cover plus 20 years, and information related to uh, mapping human population density and uh, population density trend plus 20 years. Finally, seven step, the user can uh, retrieve uh, his assessment and download it in a zip file. The zip file contains all the steps, all the justification, all the information that the user has, and uh, upload it on the CIS. Um, the platform documentation is available on page, but the steps are described detailed in, the, uh, in the, this document. If you need other information, I'm here and I can play for you our assessment, but rapidly. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Francesco, for showing us this and how the science can help this important um, uh, tool that is the red list you know, for managers. Um, it's, uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, uh, some questions from the audience? Okay. Yes. Thank you, it's a very nice presentation. My question was uh, uh, about the adoption or the linkage of with um, IUCN, of course. Yeah. So, will it be it's fully functional? Will it be really adopted by IUCN for all their assessments? Or is it or still working yeah, on that? It is a roadmap. Uh, and basically, IUCN is aligned with us. But uh, today we are uh, in a beta version and then uh, are not totally uh, aligned, they uh, are not totally uh, with UCN, within the assessment of UCN. But we try to, to, to become a single uh, organization in the, and to perform our service to them. Time for a short question. Any other question? So, thank you. I think it's very important uh, what you've shown us. Uh, 
what, what's your way to ensure that extremely rare species that have just like one or two remnant uh, places and sites where the ones that provide the data are very cautious to make these data available? So in IOCN, normally the, uh, the location is not given to, to users. Um, so if this has just one, one population, then we see on the map a uh, large basis around the real location. Uh, how, how do you deal with these? Because many people in nature conservation are reluctant to provide data on extremely rare species. The assessor is totally involved in the UCN and much. Then, if uh, they work with UCN, they are totally aligned with them and they are totally uh, are able to share this data, basically. Uh, concerning the rare species, uh, we have a dedicated session uh, in September uh, because it is a problem not only in terms of lack of data, but also in terms of uh, an analysis in the fine scale. This is quite different from analysis in the big scale. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions and thanks Francesco for the presentation. And we are uh, moving to the next the next uh, speaker, um, Dr. Daniel Crespo from the uh, Life Watch Earth in University of uh, Aveiro, talking about um, Life Watch Earth survival uh, vulnerability workflow. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm talking. Uh, my behalf and on the behalf of uh, Eliana and Julian Radu, which is over there, I'm going to talk and describe um, this uh, workflow, the biotrop vulnerability workflow on the, the CIPAL version. What is CIPAL? It's an index for the cumulative impacts of invasive avian species. So, we are here, we all uh, know what LifeWatch is about. It's about uh, e-science. And what is e-science? Um, uh, what's the purpose of e-science? Is to improve the knowledge and obtaining rapid responses. And for LifeWatch, uh, it has focused on the, on the, the, the impacts of invasive uh, alien species. And these kind of tools are useful for researchers, technology, and citizens all over the place. Uh, so, what is e science? It's a computationally uh, intensive science, it uses large uh, data sets, and it's a collaborative, computationally intensive research. Uh, and depends on the, these large e infrastructures, on the distributed network. With computing environments, and it's usually multidisciplinary. So, this is the perfect uh, uh, target uh, uh, to be. Uh, uh, invasive species are the perfect target to be applied within uh, LifeWatch. Uh, we all, all heard of virtual research environments. This is the, the, the way that LifeWatch is working. Uh, and the, the invasive species were chosen as the first demonstration case of the functioning of the life watch sharing infrastructure. Um, there are uh, five workflows that were developed within the internal joint initiative. Christina will talk a little bit of those uh, in a while. Uh, but I focus on the biotope uh, workflow. So why do we need uh, this biotop vulnerability workflow? Uh, we are aware that invasive species are one of the, the highest, uh, one of the greatest impact sources on biodiversity. Uh, the trends are increasing uh, over the last decades, and so it's a source of uh, compositional change, and ultimately will lead to global uh, almost the generation of uh, biodiversity, so it's a really uh, a huge problem. The impacts span uh, from ecological to economic, and they interact and they feedback um, one uh, so among them. The impacts could be 
uh, seen on biodiversity, but also on the, the services that this biodiversity provide. And also, uh, there are strong economic impacts that arise from the direct losses of biodiversity, but also on the resources that are applied uh, to solve the problems created by uh, invasive species. So it's more than an ecological issue, it's, uh, uh, it spans through ecology, economics, social sciences, engineering, resources and management. So uh, LifeWatch decided to uh, uh, use innovative species as a, a, a study case. Researchers have improved knowledge on the pathways. Uh, of uh, invasive species, on the mechanisms that uh, allow invasion to occur, and on the impacts. But we are still lagging behind on the prevention, on the management and control, and the mitigation of uh, invasive species. That's why, ah, sorry, despite uh, there are uh, several regulations across the globe and at the, at the regional and national levels. There are several uh, regulations on biological invasions, and that's why we need uh, these biotop of vulnerability works on to address uh, these problems of prevention, management, and control. So the objective of the biotop of vulnerability workflow is uh, to assess the risk of invasive uh, introductions and. Uh, the introduction establishment of the invasive species to assess the habitat vulnerability and estimate the impact of the, the, the invasions on, uh, on biotopes. Uh, it's based on occurrence data curves, which are three dimensional uh, structures that aggregate uh, te taxonomic, temporal, and spatial data <coughs> and allows the, the, the homogenization of uh, different kinds of data in these, uh, these structures. So, the cumulative impact uh, of invasive uh, alien species um, uses uh, data from species occurrences, the taxonomy of the species, also uses information on of, of the, the uh, the impacts of on uh, habitats and uses uh, GIS information on the, the habitats. However, it's a very flexible uh, index because we can uh, work at any geographic scale or um, or with any uh, uh, organism group. And the, the way that the weights are uh, classified could be uh, highly flexible, it depends on the user. So, in our case, we are now using uh, two different strategies to, uh, to assess the, the, the weight of the impact. We are using this percussionary approach, where we derive the, the impact of the invasive species, only uh, focusing on uh, uh, literature uh, with uh, experimental data, but we can also use this uncertainty averse approach, which brings information from uh, <coughs> literature uh, based on less robust information. However, we need to make this ponderation, and therefore we uh, classify the impact based on the strength of evidence. So there is a, a large flexibility on the use of this uh, impact, uh, impact index. Uh, this is the kind of output that we have on the, the, the simple um, calculation. Uh, the, the, the maps seem similar, but in reality there are differences on some uh, areas, which means that um, both approaches could have uh, could give you different information, however, they should be presented uh, to, the, to the stakeholders uh, together. We can also have information 
on the, the impacts due to uh, the different pathways of introduction and also on the, the type of habitats uh, that are uh, under study. So this is the, the schematics for the, the workflow. Um, and this is the kind of input that we need to run the, the, the workflow. Uh, from the first uh, version of the Simpal, of the Simpal index to the version that is now implemented on the, the LifeWatch platform, uh, has been some improvements. One of which uh, is the, the first version. Uh, was uh, uh, for each cell uh, the information was additive so if uh, an, an impact was for a species was calculated on this one cell, that's one cell uh, and we think that habitat it has an additive uh, effect but now we have a, a higher resolution approach which allows uh, higher refinement of the impact uh, and using the long range of the species, uh, we can calculate. We only had uh, the, the impact if the species uh, long range crosses uh, the certain uh, habitats that, it, that, that is present on that grid. So this is an improvement from the first version of the of the simple uh, the simple index. This is again uh, some outputs of the simple. This one uh, this one allows the, the uh, this one is based on the dispersion radius, and this is uh, a, the cumulative grid of the of the, the impact. So what can we explore from this uh, workflow? Uh, we can identify areas at risk, hotspots of invasion, and highest potential impacts. We can run rank habitats according to vulnerability and focus on priority habitats and their conservation status. We can also look at the species level, level uh, to assess the cumulative impact by species. You can rank species according to their highest threat. And on the perspective of management, we can um, have information on, uh, of the impacts by pathway of introduction. Sorry. Uh, so for more information, you can visit our uh, LifeWatch website. This is the direct link for the workflows. And so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Um, any question from the audience? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Very useful. In terms of the uh, weighting the impacts, I mean, how you do that? Like, one species might have um, many different impacts of different magnitude. So how? So uh, we have a protocol uh, that defines the the weight of the impact based. <coughs> On this um, checklist, on the uh, on the effects of the that particular species on a particular habitat, and this is um, so this is published. This is the protocol, and we classify on the table uh, according to the the impacts and the, the 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 kind of data that the paper of the manuscript describes. So, if you are talking uh, of an uh, uh, experimental uh, approach uh, on lab or on the field uh, experiment, the, yeah, uh, the high. Uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, a high. A, a high strength of happiness. Um, even though, even if the impact is low, we have a, a, a high uh, strength of evidence. But if we are talking about the experiment, uh, expert judgment, even if the, the expert says that there is a high impact of the species on a certain uh, environment, we downgrade the, the magnitude of impact uh, for a lower, uh, because of the lower strength of evidence. So this is published, there is a, a 
capabilities uh, of these impacts. Uh, but we are using this approach, but uh, the user can define their own criteria to uh, work the, the workflow. Uh, another thing, uh, it's we are focused on uh, invasive species, but these index could be used for other kinds of impacts. For instance, we can use the impacts of uh, herbivory on certain habitats. So we can change uh, the, the way that the workflow, uh, we can change the type of inputs to serve our needs. Thanks. Um, any other short question? Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that, that it's in the well, you can apply all these analysis through different scales. But I was wondering how you, for example, imagine that you have an invasive species in, I would say, very located ponds locally, that the impact could be quite high. But if you measure in the whole area, do, do you consider it a high impact or, or it can reduce? Or, so how how you know the scale affects this type of analysis? It's not clear to me. Yeah, so uh, the outputs are um, are given uh, on a grid, so on a, a raster file. So we if. Uh, if the, the, they're, they're, they're very scattered, the impacts are low on a global uh, scale, but we can identify that uh, hotspot of impact uh, on a very small scale. And that there is enough resolution to define that impact. But uh, on the uh, on statistic, statistics, uh, uh, Sorry, uh, on a statistics uh, output, the impact is in fact low uh, on that larger scale. I'm not sure if I. <coughs> My only concern is that imagine that you have this situation, and for from the management point of view, some you know policymakers decide that because the impact is low, they do not nothing. But in fact, there are several hot spots potentially, you know, with high impact that can spread later on in the future in the whole area. So I think in terms of, you know, early warning system, it would be good to have a kind of early warning say, hey, there are several spots, high impact, now take decision on how, how for example, to repeat it or do whatever. Yeah, so we can increase the zoom on those areas and provide that information for, for the management and describe, okay, this is a, uh, a very impacted place, and you can see on the red uh, on the red flags that appear on the on the, the rest of files. So yeah, we can use it, can zoom in as much as we want if if we have that kind of information. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, you need to move to the next um, uh, talk. Um, I am Christina Di Muri from the National Research Council of Italy, but designed solutions to address the known unknowns of invasion of biology. Thanks. Thank you. So, hi everyone, I am Christina, I work for the National Research Council of Italy, uh, and today I'm going to give a talk um, and I'm going to add something on the top of what uh, our CEO already said and about uh, on top of what uh, um, uh, Daniel just presented. Uh, I'm going to, in fact, uh, introduce you a general overview of the e-science tool that we have developed uh, within the core project of the Life of Cherik. And also, I'm going to uh, present you some of the gaps that we still need to address about invasive alien species. So, uh, as also, also Professor Villa uh, showed before, um, uh, there is an increasing number of publications uh, about invasive alien species, uh, and this is growing steadily uh, since uh, the early 20s. Um, so, uh, there are over uh, 34,000 publications, uh, only retrieved by uh, Web of Science, but I'm sure there are, there are even more uh, evidence than this. And so um, the interest of the scientific community towards this topic uh, has been uh, growing a lot. 
and uh, uh, this is uh, the lands, the publication landscape uh, showing only the 15 major topics that are covered by um, uh, this publication. And of course, as you can appreciate from the, from the figure, um, the, 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 the issue is very complex uh, because it involves uh, a lot of disciplines. Uh, so we need e-science to, to address this uh, complex demands. So for this reason, uh, I for Cerec decided to um, um, focus uh, to develop the, the product of the virtual research environments that are going to be used within the infrastructure uh, on uh, invasive alien species. And uh, um, by involving uh, different research groups and um, uh, ICT developers in five different um, a workflow uh, had been uh, uh, conceived and designed, uh, which were then translated into virtualization environments. Um, this, of course, addresses a number of different questions using different type of data. Uh, for example, um, the, uh, one of them used uh, um, remote sensing data to uh, predict, predict uh, spreading scenarios of uh, invasive alien plants. And uh, um, two uh, workflows uses, uh, use um, eDNA uh, metabarcoding data and metabarcoding data uh, to uh, early detect invasive species in uh, aquatic habitats. And uh, one workflow uh, assess ecosystem and habitat vulnerability to, uh, alien, uh, to alien species, which is uh, the workflow uh, that, just, um, that Daniel has just presented. And then we have also another workflow uh, which focuses on uh, um, uh, evaluating the trophic, the trophic impacts uh, by using uh, stable isotope, uh, stable isotope appliances. So of course, many, many resources have been uh, developed. Um, there are um, data set services uh, um, which are embedded into these workflows that, were, um, uh, that are available as uh, five different virtual search environments accessible from the um, let us check website. And this is not only about uh, technological development, uh, it's also about uh, scientific outcomes. And for example, um, we, uh, um, Let's Check has offered the possibility to uh, publish in uh, uh, a topical collection of uh, data services papers of uh, Biodiversity Data Journal. And here, basically, uh, this is a collection of uh, a data sets um, and services that belongs to these uh, workflows and then um, are um, used as input data sets or also as uh, produced as output data sets within this uh, virtual search environment. And uh, this is a process that we started last year, and this is uh, still ongoing, there will be many other publications. And the first three um, describe uh, five different data sets that, are, that can be used by the user and integrated with other data, custom data, for example, to explore uh, and address different questions. And this is one of the examples of how uh, the workflow, um, the functional, in this particular case, the functional biogeography workflow, um, can be explored to um, uh, uh, assess the trophic impact of invasive alien species. In this case, uh, we have used uh, as uh, model species uh, um, the Atlantic blue crab and the red swamp crayfish. Uh, we have uh, collected stabilized of data um, through data mining or using um, custom data to basically and uses the functionalities within the workflows to calculate the trophic position of uh, the species and different location. And then uh, we use the workflow to uh, find environmental predictors or drivers of this uh, trophic position. Um, we found this fact that uh, um, temperature-related variables uh, are, um, are correlated to the trophic position, and in particular there is an inverse correlation. Um, so the higher, the, the lower are the temperature, the higher is the trophic position of these invaders. And this, of course, can be changing uh, in the future um, and with um, the uh, ongoing cl climate change. And so, uh, so far so good. I would say there are a number of ed evidences uh, demonstrating uh, the impact of invasive species worldwide, uh, but we still have uh, many gaps that we need to address. 
Um, and I'm gonna mention only three of them. I'm sure there will be many, many more. Um, one of these gaps is, uh, for example, related to uh, data reliability. And when we are trying to retrieve data from literature, it's very difficult to access this data. Most of them are, in fact, published as uh, supplementary material uh, or uh, are just included in the paper as uh, in the form of figures, of graphs, so data mining uh, is very, very complex and requires a lot of time. And this is because uh, the practices of uh, uh, the use of fair principle or open science practices uh, have been appreciated, started to be appreciated only in the last couple of decades. So uh, it's very complex um, to, um, to retrieve data and therefore to respond to questions such as, for example, the long-term uh, dynamics, uh, effects, or impact uh, of invasive animal species in different, uh, in different ecosystems. Because despite many evidence has been collected, the raw data uh, for most of them is still missing. Um, to illustrate the other um, two gaps, I'm going to rely on a scientific publication that has uh, just been released in the, the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, three weeks. And uh, here, uh, Stevenson team um, synthesized the last uh, 35 years of uh, research in, of, on invasive alien species using um, the atopic modeling approach. So they basically scrutinized over uh, 10,000 uh, 10, um, a papers and uh, um, uh, extract the abstract and have used uh, uh, R to uh, understand which were the most uh, researched topics uh, in the literature. As you can see from this, uh, um, from this figure, uh, there are many biases that um, um, uh, uh, are related to uh, um, differences uh, um, in uh, research, uh, research topics, uh, taxonomic groups, and geographical area. I mean, the more, more uh, some research areas are more investigated than others, for example. And uh, in particular, there, are, um, there is a bias towards some, some taxonomic group that are more um, uh, studied than others. And for example, as you can see from uh, the, with the green arrow, I have highlighted the plants, and in blue, uh, crayfish. I'll say that I'm partially responsible for this. So this uh, taxonomic group are so um, uh, much investigated that they um, basically constitute um, uh, two uh, topics, uh, uh, three topics per se. And uh, also they have highlighted um, uh, how the concurrence between different topics uh, is uh, generally very low. And this is in particular for um, policy management strategies and uh, other scientific disciplines, uh, which highlight not, not only the lack of general multidisciplinarity, but also how there is a big gap between science and uh, policy. So we still need to address um, many things. And of course, the science tool provided, I'm uh, just, this is the last one. <laughs> is that it's cool and uh, provided by the research infrastructure can help us to address some of this topic. And, uh, in fact, they can uh, promote and support scientists in applying uh, fair and open science uh, practices. Uh, they can provide uh, um, technological facilities and uh, uh, increase the computational power and uh, um, uh, the analytical time. Therefore, it can speed up the time at which responses can be found and uh, um, they can encourage the networking and thus the multidisciplinarity across uh, of, of, in the field of invasion science but also in other fields and uh, they can also sustain facilities and their research in the long run so that's me done uh, thank you for the attention thanks for the talk um, we have time for a brief uh, question uh, from the audience. I think um, this is a very promising uh, discipline. We need to encourage the use of open science, from data management, and to encourage uh, not only researchers but other kind of end users to 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 change the culture and the data and the data management to 
move forward. It requires definitely like an effort, but uh, it must be done if you want to um, reuse what's, what's uh, out there. Yeah. So, From Evochery, we, we are encouraging uh, researchers and, and other kind of producers, policy makers, and um, to try to, to, to help them. No? If, if, if we give them this kind yeah. of resources, uh, they can see yeah, that. Yeah, the science, the scientists that can help um, this work. I think there is also another topic more about the mobilization, so mm -hmm. we hear us more. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So, is the idea to have a repository of um, a spread uh, databases um, in uh, uh, Let Me Share It? Yes. Yeah. So now, um, for now, we are using uh, the data portal repositories, which is provided by Life of Italy, but it's integrated with uh, the Life of Cherry metadata catalog. So all the data can be also found through the metadata catalog. Um, so I'm sure um, the, the metadata catalog also collects uh, other um, uh, data and things from other procedures as well. Um, so yeah, we need to integrate basically all, um, everything. So it depends also on the type of data that the user wants to publish. Um, so the different repositories, of course, uh, target different type of data. So. Okay, um, thanks, uh, thanks Christina, and uh, thanks um, all the speakers uh, for, for these interesting um, talks. Um, and uh, thanks the, the, the attendees for the interesting questions, providing some good point of views uh, for the discussion. Now we have um, time for a short uh, break or a coffee break. We, 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 can, we can start, uh, we can continue the, the discussion, and then after the break, the minute break, um, we will continue the session. Thanks. Um, but I'm very glad that we continue the session on the major threats on the, the Earth's biodiversity. We we'll also see some solutions or projects that will be working on solutions or smart sensors. Um, but first of all, I would like to introduce um, Barbara Goska, and she will present the Mabefis uh, project. Good morning. Um, I would like to uh, say a few words about the Mabefis project. Increasing uh, anthropogenic uh, in, uh, impact and also the climate change causes the uh, dramatic decrease of the coastal and marine biodiversity. And is, this is the challenge to protect the biodiversity, but also to keep the ecosystem services and societal benefits. Uh, it is very important to value the biodiversity and ecosystem services. To meet these goals, um, the Mark of the Spirit was developed. It was created under the leadership of Professor Jan Martin Bensławski from Institute of Oceanology, Polish Academy of Science. The main objectives of the project are to increase awareness of the consequences of the biodiversity loss for uh, society and stakeholders. Also to develop a monitoring framework based on the previous uh, projects and span it to the larger areas. Also to engage the stakeholders to fully participate in the project, to the knowledge creation, to decision making, uh, to be sure that the outcomes will be relevant and feasible. Also to explore synergies with other European Union missions and accelerate the blue economy not only in the European Union but globally. It is important that the uh, outcomes will uh, be transparent and uh, long term.
The uh, main aim of the project, project is to determine the links between the biodiversity and functioning of the coastal and marine ecosystems and the resulting ecosystem services and the societal benefits. To achieve ecological and socio-economic valuation throughout innovative tools to enhance the stakeholders to secure benefits and for current and the future generations. And also to understand the causes and the consequences of the biodiversity loss and loss and gain of the uh, ecological and economic services. The MARBFS is based on the previous uh, projects uh, connected mainly uh, with the uh, marine biodiversity, for example, the Marbena, Biomar, or um, Marbef. Uh, in the Marbefes project, the knowledge from the previous works will be gathered and uh, fill the existing gaps, especially those connected with the ecosystem functioning in all levels of biological organization from cells and gans uh, throughout the individuals and population to uh, communities and uh, ecosystems. To meet these goals, the project involved a lot of uh, experts from different uh, disciplines uh, from uh, marine science. In this project are involved 23 institutions from 14 countries. Uh, so broad cooperation uh, gives opportunity to experts from different disciplines uh, to be involved together and easily exchange the knowledge between the disciplines to, for better view for the society, how important it is to protect the biodiversity. many ways to value the biodiversity, for example, monetary value, uh, cultural or ecological. The pathways from the biodiversity to value, it's via uh, ecosystem services. Many of them are already really good known. For example, sea uh, provided food, uh, biodiversity protect from flooding or High biodiversity is uh, attractive for the tourists. But there are also some services that are still far less known. For example, the carbon sequestration or the uh, climate regulation service. It's important to uh, fill these gaps to show the society how is it important to protect these values. Uh, the project is divided into the seven uh, work packages. The task of the first one is to engage the stakeholders and the governance to produce the um, biodiversity conservation. The bucket uh, two is uh, responsible for the um, established broad belt transacts to as a test areas. And the task of package three is uh, uh, develop the tools to assess the biodiversity, uh, ecosystem functioning, and uh, ecology, uh, ecosystem uh, services. Package four is responsible for um, developing the handbook 
for economic and uh, ecological valuation of the biodiversity and ecosystem functioning to better predict uh, the human pressure. And the package five is uh, the task is to uh, implement the climatic and socio-economic scenarios to assess the um, to predict the, the future scenarios. And the package six, it, this is upscaling and outscaling the outputs for the stakeholders. And the uh, package seven, it's responsible for the coordination of the project. And this is the interface uh, of the project to the uh, outside world. Um, the tools of Marvelous project will be implemented into in uh, 12 broad belt transects, which uh, are in the four main re regions in Europe, from the Arctic to throughout Atlantic and Baltic to Mediterranean. These regions were um, extensively studied in the last few decades, and we already know that uh, there are no universal response of uh, marine ecosystem to ongoing changes, and there is uh, no universal management that can be uh, uh, put in these areas because the uh, um, responses of the ecosystems are different. For example, the changes in the biodiversity in the Arctic with several climate change will be different than in the Mediterranean, where, which faces with the influx of non-native species. That is why this project is covered um, a broad area from the sub-Arctic to sub-tropical, from coastal to the open sea, from brackish Baltic to the full marine areas, and from low biodiversity to the high biodiversity. Uh, we have a lot of data from these regions, but uh, still there are some data are missing. For example, those connected with the carbon sequestration, about the microbial processes, about the metabar coding and uh, functional trait data. And the aim of this project is to fill these uh, knowledge gaps and also to implement new uh, tools for the monitoring and new um, indicators uh, for um, better recognition of the uh, ongoing changes. That's why in this project are involved so many people from different disciplines. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Barbara, for this nice overview. Are there questions at this moment for Barbara? If this Thank you. I was wondering how many of the ecosystem services are connected and they are correlated. So if you affect one, it may affect in another way another. So how can the system deal with such interdependencies of your services? Yeah, it's, it, everything is um, complicated, of course, but uh, there is a lot of knowledge that we already have. And uh, the idea is to uh, use the knowledge that we have and span it for the more uh, span it just to, to know more yes so based on the, the things that we know I think that we can uh, use it and uh, predict how the, the services can um, influence each other. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, we've heard a lot about the FS project and the ecosystem services of the marine environment. We will now go back to monitoring and smart sensors to really uh, fill the gap of, the, of data. So I, would, I would like to introduce Diego Tejada from the National Institute of Aerospace Technology.
So the floor is yours. Hello everyone, uh, I am Diego Tejada, I come from the uh, energy area from the uh, National Institute for Space Technologies and my presentation is about the role of uh, renewable energies uh, in, in the monitoring of biodiversity and ecosystems. First of all, we will talk about uh, uh, renewable energies in, in environmental surveillance and some constraints that we have to overcome to uh, design a, a renewable energy system. Uh, then we will talk about uh, the entire project and the activities that we are involved <coughs> in facing the, the assessment of the chosen technologies. Uh, we will talk about the inter capabilities to, to test these uh, technologies and then we will talk about the uh, other project developments in order to uh, carry some tests to, to assess the, the environmental uh, and other extent. Okay, uh, to, when designing a renewable uh, energy system, we have to, to know every task that are, uh, are being carried. So, uh, in order to know and to design a, a renewable energy system, as we have to know, for example, consumption, energy on board, and uh, the frequency of the test in order to, to, to design a, a suitable uh, energy system. And uh, of course, we can take in advance advantage, I mean, the, the free space that we have, the impact is very low, I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, the impact over the area is very low as uh, we assemble the system, then we carry the test, and once finished all the test, we, we can disassemble it and take it to another place. Okay. Uh, the, in the project, the activities that we are involved uh, is a collaboration with the University of Seville, and uh, it consists mainly in the design and conception of a <coughs> renewable energy for two main applications. The main, the uh, first application is uh, focused in the in the uh, main platform that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, and uh, uh, low consumption uh, system, renewable energy system, in order to uh, supply energy to uh, low power sensors for use in data acquisition in some points uh, around the around the reservoir. Okay, the first solution that we propose is a floating solution with uh, solar system. It's, uh, on board, which has 10 PV panels producing uh, 5 kilowatts peak, and uh, it, it has a, a solar inverter tool, three phases, and uh, a monitorization uh, kit of sensors in order to, to know the status of the, of the installation and some environmental parameters. Then, for low power sensors, we have a, a several systems based on energy harvesting devices in order to supply the low power sensors. For, for example, IoT devices that its consumption is very low. So, uh, we take it, uh, the advantage of this kind of system that takes the mechanical energy from the waves on, on the, in the middle of the water. And, and produce some the, the, the needed uh, energy. So uh, to assess these chosen technologies, different technologies, in INTA we have several uh, facilities. And for example, we have a battery and test, a battery test bench in order to know if a battery is suitable for, for this application. 
if it, is, it can afford the, the consumption of the, of the several sensors that we have to supply. Uh, then we have, a, for example, a climate chamber in order to see if the, the system works under several, the several weather conditions that we can, we can uh, be working in. Then, uh, for the cell test benches, we have over there too, in order to assess if a fuel cell system can supply uh, the, the different loads that we have, for example, in the main, uh, in the main platform. Then, uh, to test the several technologies under real conditions, not in the test benches, uh, we have our microgrid in which we, have, we can uh, integrate almost any technology. And uh, in, in the different, I mean, depending the, the different uh, technology that we have. For example, if we have a generation technology, we have our generation side, which is this side over here. Okay, it's composed by several PV panels uh, installations and a wind turbine. Then we have uh, the storage system, which is composed by a battery lithium ion battery bank, a lead acid battery bank, and super condensators, super capacitors. I mean. Then we can simulate uh, the consumption uh, caused by uh, several sensors or even the main platform by means of a electronic LOA, which is programmable, that we can simulate, for example, the consumption uh, that is made on the main platform or hidden <laughs> sensors, and so on. This is uh, an installation uh, thought uh, for our concept, uh, the conception of this installation is for, for a stationary application to the mine, but we can use for, for almost any that, you, that, you, that we can imagine. But, then uh, we can use all the straight energy and produce energy to produce hydrogen. For us, hydrogen is a per uh, energetic vector. This means that uh, we can use hydrogen when we need, to depend on, on the, uh, weather conditions or if there is sun or if there is wind or whatever. So we can, we can produce uh, energy through hydrogen through a, a fuel cell or just a combustion engine and so on. So uh, we produce hydrogen with a, a electrolyzer, elect, a electrolyzer in different technologies, PEM or alkaline. And then this hydrogen is stored by means of pressure, low pressure, and metal hydrogen, or uh, we pressurize it in order to to uh, stretch it in high pressure. Then we will use this hydrogen in vehicles or maybe stationary uh, fuel cells and so on. So, uh, facing two mobile applications, for example, I want to introduce you a simplified uh, diagram of a human uh, vehicle that we normally find it with only batteries, of course, the electric motor and the DC loads that represents the onboard PC, navigation devices, and payloads. But we try to uh, increase the range of these unmanned vehicles by means of renewable resources and a fuel cell system with uh, proper uh, hydrogen storage, of course, a connection for recharging batteries and the and, uh, Refueling of the hydrogen is included too. So, in this sense, we are developing a, a humane a water surface vehicle, which is called. It is developed under the Dobler project, together with IFTEC and Theo Cardenal and Beta University. And it is one meter long, uh, 12 kilograms of weight. Uh, it, the hull is 3D painted in ABS with reinforced with uh, carbon fiber, and the expected endurance is 12 hours and a maximum speed of 2 knots. The payloads 
hard to redefine, but uh, it contains a onboard PC and we can adapt almost any any payload and we carry we can carry almost any experiment that, that we think. Uh, a next uh, project is the IUFCB project, which uh, the uh, development are mainly two uh, platforms. The first one is a humane uh, brown vehicle, which is a commercial platform sold by Robotnik, and it's originally uh, sold uh, with uh, batteries and works with only batteries. It's an electric vehicle, but we did some uh, integration of the we did the integration of the of the process and hybrid system. And a data that I wanted to, to remark is with batteries we reached two and a half hour or something like that. And once the integration was made and everything inside the vehicle, we reached almost seven and a half hours. It's a significant uh, increase of, of the mission events. This project is developed with the University of Seville, the city of Australia, and Interpol. This uh, vehicle uh, it contains payloads such as uh, panty zoom and cameras, uh, LiDAR, uh, GPS, uh, onboard PC, and so on. So it can adapt almost any payload that, that we can imagine. Uh, this platform was used in a, a in another project called Tecnolivo, with the, together with the University of Huelva and and another entities from from Spain and Portugal. And this project, for example, was a, a, about a monitorization of holograms to monitor some plaques, some uh, uh, water water necessities, and, and so on. Then the other, uh, the other side of this project, the, the other development, is a power plant for a submarine to, to survey the barrier reef of, uh, of Australia. This is a very challenging plant, uh, power plant because uh, we included a fuel cell that works with the ambient air, with the oxygen uh, concentration of the air. So we have to give this concentration of oxygen inside the hood. So it is a very, very, very challenging uh, uh, power plant. Of course, we have to, to carry the oxygen and the, the hydrogen. So uh, the last platform that I want to present you is a target drone, uh, which originally works with uh, an internal combustion engine. And we did the conversion at, at first step to an electric uh, aircraft, and then uh, the second step will be in a, in a few weeks. I mean, uh, the, the integration of a uh, fuel cell and, and hydrogen tank. So uh, the solutions that we propose and we have for for environmental surveillance are so. So wide, and we can adapt every every uh, power plant to, to uh, the, the the application that we are involved. So, thank you for your attention. Here is my presentation. If you have any questions. Thank you, Diego. We have time for one very short question. From UCL, thank you for the presentation. Uh, what is the what is the autonomy of the of the last drone that you showed? Uh, you mean the aircraft? Yes. Uh, we didn't test it already, but uh, we we designed the power plant for one hour of flight. I mean, the first the takeoff, then uh, climbing to to the altitude, nominal altitude, and then uh, turn around for for one hour. Then the, the retrieving of the of the aircraft. Thank you so much.
<laughs> Can I follow up with another technical question? So, what is the uh, battery capacity that you have in the ground robot? The ground robot. The ground robot beats uh, 27 uh, amps hours. The nominal capacity. And which voltage? With which voltage? Uh, uh, lithium polymer batteries. Voltage. Ah, voltage. Sorry. <laughs> at at uh, 25 volts. It's seven cells. Seven okay. cells. Thank you very much. We have to move to the next speaker because we still have quite some uh, presentations before lunch. I would like to invite Irina Irina Lopez from the Damiana Biological Station, so she will talk about pets. Uh, So, good morning everyone, thank you very much. I'm Elena Kera from Doñana Valladolid Station and I'm working as a postdoc in the Sumha project with the Bat Lab. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me introduce you to the greater nocturnal bat, uh, the Nicta lucniaceotilus, which is the largest species of bat in Europe and it is mainly insectivorous, but it can eat occasionally some birds during migration and this was discovered in the Doñana Bat Lab. Um, and what is uh, more important, it is that, uh, as you can see here, it is a tritillin species, it grows in holes, so this is make it very difficult to survey and find, find their populations, and this uh, it is one of the main problems with the species, because uh, if we see here, for example, the known distribution of the species in Spain, as you can see, it is very patchy and scarce distributed along the, the, the peninsula, and uh, here in southern Spain, we can find uh, a group of uh, the most important colonies that are known in, in the whole world. Uh, if we focus in, in these colonies that we know, one of them, I'm very happy to say that we are just very uh, close uh, to this colony in Sevilla, in uh, Maria Lisa Park. I don't know if you have visited yet or not, but as we were discussing yesterday in the round table, uh, this is one of the important values also of Sevilla, not only uh, the Maria Lisa Park as a monument, but also the colony of the Greater Nocturne, and this, it is one of the most important colonies in the world. Uh, we also have another one here in the Doñana Valladolid Carousel, uh, that is from Bad Doses, that, that we'll explain to you later. And another one, it is in the Zoo Botanical Gardens of Jerez. As you can see, we have these three uh, colonies that are like a uh, Bermuda Triangle, that I will discuss also this later. And then we have in Alcornocales Natural Park, uh, that is a very huge uh, forest, uh, a very huge area, and uh, we know that uh, there is a population there too, but it's really big and it's very difficult for us to solve it. So we have locals in these three populations that are the ones that from the bat lab we have been monitoring for several, several years. And this is the main uh, focus of the, the main objective of the study, to see the trends of these uh, bats uh, along these three po populations. Um, so, oops, sorry. So, um, First of all, the uh, Doñana uh, population, it is the best known. Uh, as I was explaining to you before, they use in bad boxes, so we have a very uh, nice uh, methodology uh, for monitoring these populations. And uh, I have to say that with the Zoom Hub, we have improved this a lot with our colleagues, uh, uh, engineering colleagues of uh, the Zoom Hub that they will explain uh, tomorrow also about this project. But as you can see here, what we have is bad boxes that uh, were, the, were the bats roots. Uh, what we do is that once in a year, we uh, capture the bats and we place them pig taggings that are like a transponder that is subcutaneous. So with these pig taggings, what we can do later that is very nice to see in this picture, it is that when the bats get in or out from the bat box, as you can see, there is an antenna in the entrance that this antenna with the transponder of the bat. It is like a chip, like from the dog or the cat. We do the same for the bats. So with this thing, it is really cool because we can have the activity of the different individual species and we can know where they roost every day in which bat box. Uh, and what is more interesting is that now, well, we have also uh, infrared uh, light cameras that we can uh, record them every day and every night when 
they come uh, in out and out from the bat box, and this is a uh, endoscope cameras that, uh, as you can see here, the uh, bats are not uh, ugly, as you can see, they are <laughs> really, really smart, and, and we can uh, introduce the cameras and see, as you can see, they are all ring, and also with the peak tagging, so we can do a very, very good uh, monitoring of the of the populations. And in addition now, with the Zoom Hub, uh, we have created this, uh, this online platform called Things More, that is the same for Kestrels that Javier Bustamante was uh, talking about yesterday. And as you can see here, uh, we can find all the bad boxes uh, with the locations, and if you enter in uh, every bad box, you can have the readings of the transponders. And we can have also the video cameras with the detection of the movements of the bats, so we know all about them. <laughs> and especially every night, what is most important is that we receive uh, in the phone a message of every bat that is coming in and out from the bat box. So as you can see, like the census that we have uh, for the Doñana colony, uh, it is like uh, really accurate. Uh, and then for Maria Luisa Park and Jerez, it is more difficult because they are uh, in human places, which is really interesting for being a, a species that is a in a species. So what we do here, it is with citizen science and volunteers uh, once a, a year in the breeding season. We uh, uh, meet all together, and every person it is uh, uh, located in one of the different rooms we know the bats use, and we do the census simultaneously in the same night. So we have the numbers uh, for every night of the bats that are in the uh, Maria Luisa and Jerez colonies. So oops, if, if we see, uh, um, also, uh, I have to say that sometimes we do some captures in Maria Luisa and Jerez, and if you are here, you are invited to come with us, it's now in June, that we do some captures, and, and again the same. We play some pit tangings, and we have seen some movements between these colonies. For example, uh, in Doñana's uh, colony, we have transponders from individuals of Maria Luisa or Jerez, so we see that they move between the, the three populations, so it's like, it is like a big meta, meta population. Um, and if we see the results of the census, in Maria Luisa Park, it is from 2016 that we are doing a standardized census. And as you can see, uh, this is the worst trend that we have seen. Uh, it is a, a, a very significant steep decline. Uh, mm, we have some uh, sparse data uh, from the year 2005 that we know that there were more than 500 uh, nautils. And last year it was really, really impressive and very shocked because we uh, counted 140 noctos, that was the half of the year before, 280. So we don't know what is going to happen this year, uh, but we um, assume that in a few years later this colony will disappear. Uh, and there is an explanation for this. Well, if we have, uh, we have used string, the uh, uh, trend and indexes, uh, Poisson regression for for the monitoring of the population. And it is already known that uh, since 2005, uh, the rose ring parakeets were introduced. Uh, you know, it is a, a, an invasive species. And we know there are many, many aggressions from the parakeets to the bats. We have found many bats uh, dead or injured. Even last, last, week, uh, last week, we found a female that was pregnant, the baby was dead, and the female is injured. And they, the problem is that the parakeets compete with the bats for the host, for nesting and the bats is where they roost. So uh, the parakeets are very aggressive and they displace or kill them. So this is one of the, of the main problems that we know it is with the Maria Lisa colony. Uh, if we have a look uh, also in the holes that are used by the bats, uh, that is, this is already published by, uh, by our colleague uh, Dinos, um, uh, if we see the holes used by the bats are decreasing along the years and the holes of the parakeets for nesting are increasing, and this is what we want to publish now, that as you can see the numbers of the parakeets are increasing and increasing, while the bats are decreasing and decreasing. So this is like unfortunately the, the uh, worst uh, situation. And if we see the results for Doniana, this is um, uh, uncertain. Uh, we think it is because, as I explained you before, there is uh, a colony in bad boxes, so it's not like a natural uh, colony. And it's like a stopover between Jerez and, and Maria Luisa. So we think that here the numbers are irregular, but we must say that this year, again, the numbers are uh, lower than 2022, like last year. So we think uh, with the all, you know, with no water, these kind of things, like in Doñana is not doing also very well uh, recently. And if we see uh, the, the trends for Jerez, 
Um, it is stable, uh, but it is true that uh, uh, in an overall, if we see the higher numbers, and now there is a, uh, a 31% uh, of decline. And uh, if I want to show you what is happening with this, like uh, Jerez, I don't know if you have been in Cardiff province, but it is surrounded all by wind farms. And also my partner, Sonia, will talk about this better uh, this afternoon. But uh, Lachenderus, it is a species that it flies up very high and it moves a lot uh, just in one night, more than 100 kilometers. So I, I don't know if you know this, but wind farms are one, uh, the, the main threat now for bats in the whole world. Like uh, in Spain, we calculate that there are 200,000 bats dying uh, every year. So for Cadiz, as there are so, so many wind farms, we know that uh, there are uh, many uh, Lachenderus that uh, die per year in Cadiz. And Sonia will explain it la later that this is uh, infraestimated and with an index that they have calculated, we assume that uh, uh, more than 700 uh, Lachenderus are dying Every, every year. And I must say that in Jerez, as I explained to you before, we tag them uh, with rings, and we have found, for example, last year that uh, we ring uh, 100 noctules, just in one week, we found four of the noctules ring dead. So a 4% of the noctules were dying just in one week due to the wind farms. And these are numbers that are very interestimated because uh, we don't receive this information from the uh, stakeholders, you know. Um, and you can see here, uh, to explain it to you before, this is Alcornocales Natural Park, and this is Jerez. So as I told you before, we know they move between Doñana and, and Maria Luisa, and also between Alcornocales. And in the, in the blue dots, you can find the wind farms, and in the red dots, there are the fatalities for the children. So as you can see, they are in the middle of a black hole, where <coughs> hole, many of them there, right? Uh, so if we see the results as an overall, you can see that the population, the meta population trends, it is a moderate decline, but we are seeing that these human uh, uh, impact factors of the uh, parakeets and also the wind farms are affecting a lot uh, to these species. And uh, uh, there is a 4% decrease in every year. And this is what we call the Bermuda Triangle, no? because uh, we, we can see that they uh, die a lot uh, in the middle with the wind farms and also with the parakeets, that we are not yet displacing them, but we know for sure they are killing them. So we should take uh, into account some measures for conservation and management, uh, removing the parakeets and implementing some uh, measures for the wind farm that they are already known that they work very well, like a cutting the wind speed and this kind of thing. So the, the noto is not dying as we think this could uh, uh, mean in the extinction of some of the populations that we already know. And now the Lasotheris is a vulnerable species. So we should do something uh, soon. And uh, I hope that it's not uh, uh, decreasing anymore, but increasing again the, the populations of the, of the Greater Norton. And I will have to say that this is not possible without uh, the help of uh, the Parkits Lab in the Nyanama Biological Station and also the Pro Botanical of Jerez and the Sociedad Americana de Historia Natural. Thank you very much. I, I was wondering if you are thinking of how you try any kind of bioacoustic methods to avoid, for example, a method that is like a range, a frequency range, that is annoying for parakeets, but it's more or less neutral for, for mm -hmm. bats. Do you put more funds on the other kind in, in the wind funds, in the other, maybe some kind of noise signal that is, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bad for that, so they avoid to, to go. Yeah, thank you. This is a really good question. Like with the parakeets, I think we, we haven't discussed or think about this, but it is true that um, uh, what we have seen, for example, in wind farms, there are already papers published that they, they reproduce like uh, uh, some uh, sounds to the bats uh, to get disturbed, and they have seen it is not uh, uh, successful. In wind farms, uh, specifically, I think it's be it is because of the uh, detectability of the bats, like when they detect the the sound is already they are very close because bats in wind farms they don't die because of collision. They die by collision, but also for bat trauma that is the the change in pressure. So they don't need to be just in the middle of the wind farm. Just flying uh, in the surroundings it makes them uh, die. So the problem is that sometimes this. Uh, um, uh, reproduction of the sounds uh, is not so high, so the bat, when they already listen to them, they are very close and they die uh, in the same way. But it's true that uh, for the parakeets, we will have to think about it. Uh, but I think, <laughs> yeah, the parakeets, uh, they are very noisy too. <laughs> 
but uh, we have seen like um, many many methods that are being carried out uh, nowadays uh, are not successful except for uh, uh, yeah, killing the, the target kids. Yeah. Okay, there are any more questions mm -hmm. in front here? Thank you so much. It's really interesting. So I, I was uh, being impressed by the long distance that they are doing in one night. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there a part of immigration? Are they coming back? There are, there are explanations for such, uh, such long distance because uh, related to the way this really looks to be really, really, really large. Thank you also for the question, and this is really interesting, and it's my next question for my next postdoc. <laughs> uh, because, well, we have been tagging them with GPS data. It is true that uh, this bat, uh, the weight is 40 grams, so it's uh, very low, but it's true that as it is the largest bat uh, in, in Europe, it is one of the first species that have been tagging with GPS, so we still very know very low. And the data that we have, we have seen that daily movements, uh, but it is daily movements, like they go away, uh, we have a record of 150 kilometers in one night from Mañana that was going uh, for, to Alcor Locales and was coming back uh, to the same place. And we know the bats in general, they move a lot because they adapt to the explosions of the insects in the moment. So it is possible that if in the surroundings of Mañana they don't have food, they can go uh, to other places to look for some flags and they provide like, really nice service ecosystems with uh, flags and pest control. So we know that they move a lot just uh, for looking for the food. But for example, in Doñana, they disappear in, in winter. So we don't know if they do migration, because this is the problem. As they are, uh, they lose in, in three months. Uh, the good thing here is that with the bad boxes, we have this really nice monitoring. But in other places in Spain, we don't know. And now in, in autumn, there is a new tag that uh, the way uh, it is already good for tagging the Lasiotrus. So what we are going to do is to place them this tag to see if they just have regular movements or if they are very migrant. Because we assume that it is possible they cross to, to, to Africa, because as you have seen, 100 kilometers, the straight is 14 kilometers, is not a big deal for them. So we want to tag them and see if they are going to Africa or if they just move to Alcornocales, because we know we have found some bats hibernating in Alcornocales. So, uh, but we don't know if they migrate or not. This is still uh, unknown, and we still have to do a lot with them. Thank you very much. I think Thank the migrating you. species are always interesting yeah. and fascinating. Uh, if you have more questions, please contact uh, yeah, Nina during lunch. And then we'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Domingo Cano Sares from the University of Cairo, and he will talk about her cover management and the impacts. Intensive farming practices mainly reduce floral resources and availability and contribute to landscape simplification in agro ecosystem. This environmental disturbance affects both earth and bee species composition, mainly driven by certain functional traits related with floral matching and habitat requirements. And this can influence the topology of the plant pollinated flower interaction network. So the objectives here was how uh, to explore how the, the intensity of, of air cover management and in all crops affect the functional traits of uh, the wild bee community and how this finally impacts in the network quality. For this, we choose as a study system the olive orchard landscape of Andalusia because even though they are a non-pollinator-dependent uh, growth, 
they provide habitats for, for the wild bees. And moreover, uh, olive orchards cover an, ex an extensive areas in the Mediterranean basin, uh, overlapping with important biodiversity and hotspots. So uh, they play an important role in the European wild bee conservation. Mm. Uh, we, we sample in 24 olive farms uh, located in 12 localities from in Andalusia. Um, uh, each pair of farms was composed by a farm with uh, low intensity air power management uh, and the other with intensity uh, air power management. The low intensity uh, air uh, management uh, involves the the maintenance of the air cover during most of the year. And conversely, the intensity the intensive management involves the removing of, of the air cover during most of the year with by using free energy and some post emerging herbicides. And uh, surveys uh, were conducted in multi in the specific flora stamp. We select two uh, uh, flora stamp per, per olive farm. And in each flora stamp, we survey uh, once monthly from March to May uh, in, for 15 minutes in the morning and 15 in the afternoon. The bee richness, bee abundance, and bee flower interaction. At the same time, we, we report the, the earth richness in the patch and the uh, uh, flower color. Okay. Mm. Um, with this data, we built quantitative and holistic networks to calculate the, the following metrics, the bioweakness in networks, interaction diversity, and specialization at network level. <coughs> um, uh, we also measure two functional traits, the ITD, intertable and distance for each species, and the relative stone length. And we also employ the abundance of, uh, we, we classify each taxon in, according to its nesting behavior, and we use the abundance of each nesting guy as another functional trait uh, of the community. With this data, we fit two sets of Bayesian multilevel models. Uh, with the locality always as a random factor. In the first one, we employ the functional diversity as response variable and the management of patch quality variables as explanatory variables. And the second set, we use the network metrics as response variable and both management uh, for air fitness and the functional traits as explanatory variables. As a result, we record around 4,800 species belonging to five families and we are identified to 177 species and more species. They perform uh, nearly 600 unique interactions between 108 species. And, uh, as you can see, the intensive management is out be species with bigger body sizes and bigger relative content. And this will be key beneficial in this condition since smaller body sizes and mean fewer resources to provide offspring in landscape where they are scarce. The abundance of knee nesting gal and kill didn't respond to the air cover management. And this could be because bees are, mm, are nesting in the surrounding semi-natural area instead of the crop matrix. Specialization at network level and increase with the increase in the community wide mean of the ITD and the tongue And uh, flora cover uh, have a positive effect on the diversity of interaction and bee richness. Um, um, and the diversity of interaction have a positive effect on the community of the body size and the relative content. 
and the management didn't show an effect on the any of the of the network metrics uh, used. So big communities with bigger body sizes and bigger relative term lengths shape more diverse and robust interaction networks, although this become more apparent at, at the local scales. And finally, as a conclusion, uh, there are cover management in all crops indirectly affect interaction networks, so for example, intensive mass, uh, management filters out big communities with bigger body sizes and relative tone lengths, contributing to networks uh, with lower diversity of interactions and lower robustness. And for uh, <coughs> increasing the availability of rural resources at the local level has a direct positive impact on the richness and diversity of interaction in, in networks. So, thank you. Thank you, Domingo. Are there questions for Domingo? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Hi I'm Miguel Ángel Collado from Universidad de Sevilla. Uh, so, you found that uh, bees with uh, bigger body sizes were filtered in less modified crops. I'm a, I'm a, okay, this, this is very interesting because uh, we we recently found that uh, bees with bigger body sizes are more prone to appear in cities, which are highly modified environments, and, uh, and we we couldn't beat that for for crops because we had the data. But it is interesting that it reversed the, the thing, um, and maybe there is. It's not that easy to, to because we, we interpret this as bigger body sizes, bigger interpolar distance, and bigger body sizes uh, lets you uh, fly farther. Yeah. So, in highly modified environments, if you don't have food here, you can fly farther away and get another patch of full of food. But in this case, it's happening the opposite, so I'm quite confused, but yeah. interested in knowing more. So I, I guess this was not a question. So, so okay, thank you. I have a question as well. So what is the effect on the olive production? These two different types of management. Do they does it have an effect? Yes, or why would a farmer do this intensive management if the other is better? Yes. Uh, in theory, the uh, management at first stage, reduce the productivity. But, but a large uh, in the, the time is better than more strict and environmental friendly. So can you convince the farmers to can you convince the farmers to do more natural uh, or do less intensive management? For now <laughs> no. Okay, one more question. We have time for one more question, yes. Hi, hello. I'm Leo Gardner, a Fernandez Research Council. The body size is strongly related with the metabolic rate of the animals. Uh, the, the body size is related with the metabolic rate of the animals. So I was wondering if you have data on metabolic rate of this uh, different population? No. Maybe it can work to look at it because it can complement your model, probably. Okay, thank you, thank you, Domingo, for presenting. I would like to invite uh, William Ignacio Ulitsa from the University of Granada. from the University of Canada are working on a project called Smart Area. I, I want to apologize in advance for my English level. Uh, <laughs> I will need to 
uh, I try to I will to try to do the best. And I will to try to be and short. Um, okay. Our project focuses on the Sierra Nevada National Park, uh, specifically on the Barranco del Bucaira. It's a very particular area in the province of Granada. And this area is made up uh, by three towns, three very small towns, but very touristic towns, Bubion, Capileira, and Pampaneira. So our project um, has been the objective to explore um, how the digital technology and uh, big data can contribute to, to the tourism and uh, to be more sustainable in the area. So what is Smart Bocaira? Smart Bocaira is an innovative project um, by the University of Granada uh, that uses uh, smart sensors to collect uh, real-time data related to the tourism and the sustainability in the Barranco del Bocaira. Oh. Um, this information helped us to understand the tourism, the traffic flows, the visitor behavior and the impact of tourism on, on waste generation. We use a different type of sensors, for example, this is a vehicle mobility cameras to measure traffic flows and tourist behavior. We have in, in the road between Pampaneira, Capilera and Bumion. We have this. Uh, these are flow sensors in urban areas to record the number of people and concentration in the central square of Pampaneira. And we have this and this that are sensor in establishment and waste containers to monitor the entry and exit flows and waste generation. So our study, this study, has uh, two main objectives. The first objective is to apply the travel cost method in the Barranco de Pocaina to obtain the, the recreational value of the area. Um, the second objective is to obtain detailed information about visitors' profiles and analyze their influence on responses and preferences. So, related to our methodology, mm -hmm. our methodology has um, several steps. Our first step uh, was design questionnaires and uh, search uh, visitors who people who visit the, the area. Then we took the information of uh, the, the answers are, um, and we combined with another information obtained by the cameras in the area. So with both information, we could applicate the travel cost method to calculate, to calculate the, the value of the, of the song of the area. It's important to, to mention that we choose the travel cost method because it's the most commonly tool uh, to know how much people are willing to pay in natural and recreational public places. And the travel cost method has different approaches. We choose the individual approach because it's the most accurate and it's the most uh, it's the the most uh, used for this uh, for these cases. So we analyze the individual trips, and we use um, regression techniques and Poisson models to incorporate some variables, for example, um, gender, income, age, origin, education, employment status, and other next steps. And with this information, we could obtain the consumer surplus per trip and per individual. Then, with this data, we could uh, obtain the total recreational value of the, the area. So, related to the results, I will start with the second objective. We, we did a descriptive analysis of the visitors 
uh, with this information and we, we could have um, a profile of visitor of the area. This information can be very helpful to design future plans and action and strategies related to the tourism in the Barangolic location. And related to our second objectives, we applied the travel cost method and we, we could calculate the average consumer surplus per individual amount. <coughs> we obtained a consumer surplus of um, 46.52 cents uh, per individual and per tree, and we could obtain the total valuation of the, the area. Uh, over the um, 50, 50, 113 something euros. So, in conclusion, uh, the travel cost method is uh, very important and very useful um, to, to obtain the value of natural and uh, recreational uh, areas. And um, it could help us to estimate fees, aerobatic aspects, and conduct data analysis. It's essential for decision making, strategic planning, and the results uh, could help us to improve visitor experience by understanding costs. But we have to mention that this uh, technique um, and this uh, this study has uh, limitations. For example, the first limitation related to the technique. The technique is an indirect method, so the result is an approximation. Um, related to our study, we took a very small sample. We took a 2,000 uh, service. So in the future, we want to expand the sample. Um, we want to explore another uh, another models. For example, we want to to expand the sample or to use um, a model of data, uh, of data augmentation to uh, obtain answers to all the visitors in one year, um, over than one hundred and eleven thousand people in one year. So, in addition, we, we want to include another variables and um, the diversity evaluation methods for capturing visit aspects. Um, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Julian. Any questions? Thank you. It was perfectly understandable, so you don't, have, you don't need excuses in the beginning. So, um, the, the question that I have is, what do you think yourself of the, of the, the amount of money that came out of these analysis? To me, it seems to be a fairly high amount, especially if you think, it's, is it, suppose a family wants to do this, eh? so it adds up. So, what, what do you think? Is, is it comparable to what you find for other, in other studies? Um, or are it high or is it low? What do you think? Yes, um, this is it's a very good question because uh, with the travel cost method, uh, all the authors uh, said dif says different uh, different uh, things. So we in this study we evaluate the families, but uh, we evaluate, uh, for example, we asked to the to to the people, okay, how many people are in the car for uh, four individuals but two adults and two kids. So we count uh, just the, the adults. Uh, this is the time. Uh, this is yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay. Was there another question? Thank you. Uh, I have not understood how did you measure the response variable in, in your model? 
May you give an example of, of how you measured the, the response variable of your fossil model? Sorry, I... the, the variable you used uh, in the in the Poisson model, the response yeah. variable was. Uh, I, I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand it. <coughs> These are the variables: uh, gender, income, age, origin, education, employment status, and overnight status. We are starting to add new variables. Okay, is there another question? Otherwise, we move to another national park in Italy that doesn't have uh, visitors. Maybe they have, but especially wildfires. So I'd like to introduce uh, Emanuele Constanzo from CNR. So, uh, hello to everybody. I am Emanuele Costanzo, I came from uh, Italy and, uh, and now I'm going to explain an incoming project that uh, was uh, uh, started uh, thanks to the collaboration between uh, the CNR uh, of, uh, and the um, National Park of Alta Lugia. Uh, actually, I am a part of the uh, Lightwatch uh, Consortium and uh, I work for uh, this project as a naturalistic uh, uh, vegetation uh, botanist. Our goal uh, started, uh, sorry, uh, the project started with the installation of an eco-valence uh, tower in the national uh, park, in particular in the Aquadecta forest. Our goal is to design a biodiversity award, a vegetation monitoring system uh, for a, a forest that was uh, treated by uh, fire events. And uh, we would monitor the post fire recovery uh, transition. Um, in particular, uh, for the Mediterranean area, uh, the post fire recovery is uh, um, uh, a, a huge problem, and uh, there are uh, several uh, points to be uh, mm, uh, uh, to look for. In particular, uh, we have to uh, verify the uh, severity of the fire, uh, which type of vegetation was uh, affected by the fire, and uh, the post fire condition of the environment. In particular, uh, from these uh, points uh, and many other uh, 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 factors can uh, uh, give uh, different evolution to the post fire uh, vegetation recovery. In particular, soil erosion and the presence of invasive species that can, of course, uh, uh, occupy uh, the uh, ecosystem. And uh, local climate changes, and of course, uh, repeated uh, fire. And knowing uh, this uh, aspect, then uh, we uh, decided to uh, uh, develop uh, such a model, uh, of course, to uh, remotely uh, uh, detect changes but of course the uh, ethical violence power uh, that I will explain uh, uh, later. And uh, for this uh, purpose, uh, we've installed sensors that are adequate for this uh, uh, kind of observation. <coughs> of course, uh, a lot of data will be collected and uh, will be developed an algorithm that can be trained on uh, labeled data uh, detected from the vegetation uh, survey. <coughs> uh, so uh, will be uh, 
also uh, included a biodiversity matrix. And all this data uh, should be uh, 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 available for any uh, consideration and for uh, stakeholders and the manager of the um, national park. For those, for those who, who is not familiar uh, with the anticovariance of the unit system, I will briefly uh, show how it works. This is a well-known system that was uh, described almost uh, 70 years ago, but uh, in the last 20 years, we uh, collect, uh, the scientific community collected a lot of data, and it's, it's improving this method. That is biased essentially on the uh, dimension of this change of gases and energy between uh, Earth's surface and atmosphere. In particular, for the anti that uh, I can... Uh, I have a little picture to show you how it works. Uh, in the tower are installed uh, uh, basically two types of instruments, a uh, 2D uh, we'll see the, uh, I think that the, the microphone doesn't go. Well, I will uh, continue until the microphone is arrived. So, uh, the instrument are basically uh, two types. Uh, uh, 3D viewed uh, meter, that is a atomic meter, and an instrument that measures the concentration of gas, uh, such as uh, carbon dioxide, uh, water vapor, and uh, in some cases also methane. All this data uh, is, uh, will be collected into a data uh, I think, and then sorry, sorry. I think you can use one of the microphones on the table. Uh, sorry. So um, I was talking about the uh, gas analyzer that uh, uh, is um, used to detect uh, <coughs> gas like uh, just like uh, carbon dioxide and the water vapor. All the data will be collected. Ah, oh, sorry. Brilliant. So, uh, the data collected by the loader will be text analyzed uh, by uh, software tools that uh, give uh, a useful uh, and uh, uh, easy way to analyze the data collected. Essentially, uh, we collect two types of uh, measurement. The net ecosystem is changed. That is uh, basically uh, the, uh, represented the carbon dioxide uh, exchange between the atmosphere and uh, uh, the ecosystem. In particular, in this picture, I uh, give you an example uh, provided by uh, the NASA Carbon Monitoring System, uh, in which we can uh, see our uh, different color represent a different type of net uh, ecosystem exchange. In particular, the green one is a net sink, so we have a negative net ecosystem exchange. The pink one is a net source. Uh, of course, this is a, a, photo, a image taken in a particular uh, season uh, of the year. So, uh, Going on on um, different seasons, uh, this uh, distribution of the net ecosystem exchange will change uh, dramatically. In particular, uh, with this method, we can uh, monitor uh, the sequestration of uh, carbon dioxide or the, uh, uh, the, the source of the carbon dioxide. <coughs> 
Ale ta rather measure you can take from the ethical analysis the indirect measurement of the ecosystem respiration. In this case, the measure is not precise, it's a little bit underestimated. Uh, we, but we will use also other method like uh, uh, chamber to well uh, estimate the, uh, the ecosystem respiration. In this picture, I show you uh, uh, the aspect of the, the area that we chosen for uh, the installation of the tower, <coughs> in particular. Uh, the national the, the national park is uh, on the uh, uh, east, southeast of Italy, and the Alta Delta Forest is a, a small portion of this park. Uh, in the, uh, we, I show you three different uh, picture uh, aspect of the of the Alta Delta Forest. In particular, the first picture uh, are taken before and after a fire event of. Uh, 2012. Uh, the area of study is divided in, uh, essentially in two different uh, 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 portions. Uh, one with uh, planted conifers, and the other one uh, is a mixed uh, aspect of the planted conifers and the cibus, uh, native and the cibus trees. The area affected by the fire uh, is uh, essentially uh, the first one, the area with uh, planted conifers. In the last picture, uh, we can uh, have a look of the area selected for installation that is almost uh, without uh, tree coverage because of the fire event. Uh, one of the most um, the most big challenge uh, with the ethical virus installation is the choose of the sites. In particular, we uh, have to, uh, uh, to uh, respect some uh, criteria, uh, like uh, homogeneous wheat field and uh, homogeneous uh, coverage of vegetation and land slope. In particular, in this picture, uh, we have uh, uh, the results of the analysis carried out from a uh, weather station started uh, not so far from the uh, candidate sites. In this picture, we can see uh, that the uh, main wind uh, came from uh, most likely from the west of the sites. So, this is uh, the candidate uh, position of the footprint of the tower. Another uh, requirement is that uh, the wind should not be too low or too, uh, too strong because uh, uh, this will affect dramatically also the, the, the calculation of the footprint. Following this, uh, this, this uh, first uh, important part, uh, we will go on with the uh, um, at first, uh, with the vegetation biodiversity monitoring. In particular, uh, we should consider that uh, this is the potential annual footprint of the tower. In the middle, uh, we, can, uh, we uh, should imagine the position of the tower, and uh, this, uh, this is the uh, potential uh, distribution of the uh, patches of vegetation that will be identified in the light, uh, just like uh, with the uh, vegetation survey. So, uh, uh, actually, we, we don't know exactly which part of the, uh, this uh, potential uh, footprint would be uh, our specific, but we can imagine thanks to uh, elaboration done before. <laughs> uh, for, the, for each uh, patch, it will be uh, conducted, uh, of course, uh, uh, survey, both uh, withdrawn and main based observation. And uh, the uh, vegetation patch will be described with uh, uh, the structure, plant community, and uh, index. 
that uh, should be uh, important to well characterize uh, the standardization of the uh, data. The next step is uh, a standardization of the uh, flat foot building itself. So <coughs> we add another layer in our uh, footprint, and this layer is uh, essentially a grid uh, that represents uh, the grid of the Sentinel 2 stacks that we use also for uh, add information about the vegetation index. Uh, with tag series that uh, will monitor uh, pigments and the chlorophyll technology. And on board, on the tower, is installed also a phenocam that uh, will help to, to better calibrate a sentinel to data. Other pigment will be uh, monitored uh, with the prisma spectrum and series uh, that uh, help. Uh, a lower resolution. To add information about uh, stress to the vegetation, we also uh, managed to install a network sensor for uh, moisture of the soil and canopy temperature. At the end, uh, the, another layer of information will be uh, provided. In this case, uh, uh, integrating uh, the biodiversity spatial distribution with the plant's spatial positioning. In this case, uh, we, uh, uh, elab with the elaboration of this data, we uh, can better uh, assess the uh, exact contribution of the global uh, plant budget uh, to different uh, vegetation page, uh, pages, because uh, uh, each different uh, page of vegetation uh, contributes in uh, various uh, 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 to the flux because of the height of the vegetation, because of the roughness of the vegetation itself. Um, and we have to keep in mind that the method uh, uh, use the, uh, the micro-turbulence of the uh, atmosphere that depends uh, most likely uh, to the aspect of uh, our uh, vegetation uh, composition. Okay, I almost, uh, this is the last uh, aspect that we be covered. In particular, uh, we managed to uh, take all the output from uh, this uh, Data collected just like the AD Pro software and uh, the shape file vegetation page with the, uh, the attributes uh, start already in uh, the center of the data and uh, by using the uh, survey to uh, promote uh, the shell methodology uh, using uh, in the live watch uh, virtual research engine. Uh, of course, this is not my <laughs> specific. Uh, 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 ability uh, and just reporting what it would be our uh, goal. Thank you for your attention. Okay, um, maybe one short question. Uh, I have a question. Um, there's another research infrastructure, Arcos. Uh, the integrated carbon observation system that also does a lot of it at the Eco Arians Towers. Is there a collaboration between you and Argos? Uh, uh, by now, we don't know exactly who would be the. who would be. Uh, give us the tower because uh, the National Park would be uh, the one who will buy uh, effectively the, the tower. And uh, they are just uh, making uh, uh, the survey for. There are only two uh, Lightor and uh, Idos. Uh, the Idos net uh, is, uh, is another goal, but we are not uh, yet. We can say we can say by now if we will be able to uh, be a part of the Idos net. It depends on uh, the results of our. Uh, 
Okay, thanks a lot. We don't have more time for questions. There's still two presentations uh, before lunch break, so if you're um, tired, please you can stand up, stretch your legs for a minute uh, while I'm uh, introducing uh, Julian Kenny from uh, the Life Arts Service Center. So if you're tired, just stand up for a minute and then you're ready for the next two presentations. Okay, good morning. Um, Julian Kenny, Communication Officer. It's very interesting, it's lovely being here in Seville, obviously. Um, and it's really interesting to come and talk about communicating science in a conference which is communicating science. Not only that, we had a wonderful discussion yesterday on the round table of the difficulty of communicating science. So, I'm talking to the converted, I don't have to convince you of anything. Um, but I would like to say, just in starting out, that um, it's not just me, obviously. I'm part of a team, a wonderful team in Lecce, with under um, Alberto here, there's Sada, there's Madeira, there's Laura, there's other people who work with us, there's Fabrizio on the, on the audiovisual side. There's also um, a communicators group in which there's at least one representative from all of the eight national nodes of the consortium. And we get together once a month to you know, coordinate what we're working on. And since they're both here, I'd like to just call out to uh, um, Juan Luis and, uh, and Javier, who are uh, Spanish cooperators and very helpful. You know, we couldn't do anything alone. You do nothing at all. We're a big team. Now, to get messages across, um, we actually have quite limited tools. You're all very familiar with the, with the website, and you know that in dealing with a scientific website, we sort of lean on icons quite a bit. So um, thank you to the presenters on the bees and pollination. You know, we've got bees up here as the symbol of a conference on biology and ecosystem and science. Um, but then, you know, we have a, a bit of a, an iconic representation of Seville because science can be quite difficult to just represent. I'm trying to look for my original title. Which was Communicating LifeWatch Eric's Online Services and Tools to Non-Scientific Audiences Through a Narrative Communication Strategy. Which for me is quite a long title. It satisfies a scientific mind because it has all the important key words. I might have put something like, you know, tell us a good story, which is a more journalistic, you know, punchy way of communicating the same thing. And that's basically what we do in the uh, communication unit. We try to communicate the detail with one hand and then a bit of a summary, a bit of a, an overview on the other hand. Um, and a lot of the detail comes out on the website. Hands up if you know the website, you go to our portal on a regular basis. Okay. The detailed content there, we then sort of spread around the world on this wonderful thing called social media, depending a lot on Facebook, less than Facebook these days, LinkedIn, and particularly on Twitter. I don't know how many tweets we've put out um, in the last two days. Hands up who's got a Twitter account. Well, that's good, but we're still only communicating with about a third of you, and that's part of the problem. So, obviously, visual is a good way to go, but the, there are a lot of acronyms involved in science, especially in biodiversity and ecosystems, and um, you know, VREs, NIS, all the things that you're familiar with. A lot of the people we want to contact are really not familiar with those things, so they need to be explained the whole time. And one of the first big challenges when I joined four years ago was 
Eric. How do you communicate Eric? Which is already a mouthful. So this is one of the pictures we used, having a, a bridge. So an infrastructure is actually a means that you use to get to something else. You know, this is a cloud-based computing infrastructure, which again, is different to visualize, which is why we're not on Instagram. Um, but there's a lot of information, you know, all your wonderful presentations, there's a lot of information to convey. The difficulty has been, still is, Wonderful challenge they're talking about at the round table, communicating with a variety of audiences. And of course, when we set up our communication strategy, we didn't want to just limit ourselves to you know the first five people we met. We wrote out in detail the strategy, uh, we defined the target audiences, we customized messages for each of those audiences, and we um, What's the one down here? Um, make it relevant to everyday life. And that's the nexus, which we're still working on. Um, try to make it relevant to people's everyday lives, while at the same time convincing you know, scientific communities who demand the detail. Um, trying to engage with politicians um, media people, one sentence will be enough. If they have the time to read a tweet, you're going well already. So you're talking about different styles to communicate with different audiences. But that is our mission. And um, in communicating the RJR, the Internal Joint <coughs> Initiative, the development of these workflows, um, we went with this approach of narrative storytelling. Humans are great at telling stories. You know, we were telling stories millennia before we invented writing. And you don't just tell a story for the accuracy. I'm from Irish background, you might guess from the Kenny name. There's no good telling a story, just the facts. You have to enhance them a bit. You have to make it a bit more colourful, throw in some emotion. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you bend the truth a little bit. Um, but to get into a conversation, which is what you'd really like, and that's the ideal state of, of social media, it's a, it's a correspondence. You're not just sending out the message, you want messages coming back in. Um, you need to build those relationships with various communities and, um, and bring your material alive. The picture of a coral reef in Thailand might speak about biodiversity. But it's got nothing to actually do with the work being done by LifeWatch Eric in Europe. It's sort of connected, but you have to sort of work off other cues where you can. So our first um, initiative on the world, well, our first channel was written. We put together a, um, a magazine, ended up being about 48 pages because you can't just talk about the five validation cases. You know, Atlantic Blue Crab, Island, the Saltissima. You have to talk about the context in which all of that is made. So you have to talk about other research infrastructures. You have to explain DNA analysis, um, isotopes, you know, food webs. There's a whole context which is not necessarily accessible to all of these different publics we'd like to communicate with. Um, not to mention life block, metadata harmonization, things which really do take a bit of time to explain in simple words. But um, this is our ongoing challenge, we're very happy to be doing it. But as an example in trying to put those validation cases into everyday sort of journalistic speech, if you like, this is just a quick quote from the um, the sort of article on the Atlantic Blue Crab, and I'll read from the slide if, if I may, and then you shouldn't really. Um, the, the Atlantic Blue Crab likes its food as an understatement. They're voracious omnivores and highly aggressive. They mutilate fish caught in traps, destroy nets, and prey on clams, mussels, and oysters. Information in their distribution is plentiful because they're so easily identified. 
but there's scarce documentation on the location of established populations, as well as on the functional role played within invaded food webs and ultimately on their ecological impact. So you see there's a bit of a mix there between um, more emotive language about you know being destructive and, and um, you know, cannibalistic as well and then try to come back to some um, scientific terms that you can sort of slot in and they can find context for a variety of, of audiences. So that was uh, our first effort. Then we moved on to video, again with the assistance of the uh, Multimedia Production Centre at the University of Salentum, and um, interviewed from the top down, introduced the idea of, of the life like Eric, of um, ecosystem functions and services, um, introduced the idea of virtual research environments, open science, and um, the collection of videos just started growing from there because um, there's so much to talk about. But I'd like to interrupt for just a minute to have a quick look at the documentary that we made nearly a couple of years ago now, a year, um, which again, thank you Emmanuele, is about the uh, Altamore International Park in Italy. If we could switch across to the video for a second. of conservation concern, as well as a, a huge uh, geological and cultural heritage. And this is why Altamusa is now included in uh, a 20,000 network, as well as in the national park. But several trees still affect Altamusa with distance, as for example, land abandonment, uh, soil degradation, overgrazing, uh, fire, and uh, also the occurrence of uh, invasive alien species which are considered as major drivers of biodiversity loss. So you see it's taking quite a while to lead you in gently to the subject matter, which is then this invasive tree, Ilanthus. Um, you might say it's talking around the subject a bit, but it's trying to dig into people's interest when you have to connect with people and uh, sort of push a button on their internal interests. You know, trying to look at a general public, if you like, who has some concern for the environment. So we're trying to move in gently on the, onto their awarenesses. Um, that was. Um, an interesting video, um, documentary, really. And then, of course, after that, that led on to the creation of a, a dedicated channel on, uh, on YouTube, Live Watching Web TV, which, if you haven't followed at all, we're, we're live streaming this conference. It's a bit like being in the football and watching the, the television report at the same time. It's great watching the, uh, the, the streaming online. But that covers all of these stuff. And, and we've got, I think it's um, more than 80 videos up there at the moment. And again, putting together content from the various national nodes of the consortium. So representing the whole of, of Europe. Last year, we moved into the area of podcasts, which is making the conversation even more open and informal and less structured as time goes by. 
to complement the structured time, the structured ways of you know, publishing papers. Um, and this is highly organised, but then spontaneous conversations with people, or many people in this, this room have, have been victims of my podcasts, and uh, if you haven't been asked yet, you will be, so you know, just um, stay, stay in touch. 10 to 20 minutes and um, reports from the work being done right around Europe in a very accessible form that you can listen to when you're going for a jog or uh, walking the dog in the morning. And that's really taken off quite well. Our overall game would be to take charge of the conversation, to be um, a point of reference for information about biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, that's obviously going to take a long time, and as the round table was saying, who's interested in biodiversity ecosystems and how does it affect my life? And that's the kind of thing that we're trying to put together in terms of creating these narratives, um, telling stories about how people are affected. But we are getting some content, we're getting some traction. So on the um, Life Watching channel, 80 videos, LinkedIn, we're moving up to the number of people following us. Twitter keeps on expanding, which is great, um, because we correspond with all the other research infrastructures and you put in the hashtag of biodiversity, you pick up people that are not connected. Facebook is growing slowly, it's still quite steady. Podcasts, I'd like to say, um, passed a, a thousand downloads in, in less than 12 months, and we're currently up at about 1,800, so they're taking off. Um, are we changing people's minds? Yet to be seen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a room for one question. There's no questions, it was well explained in the first place. Thank you, thank you, Julian. A short summary of our science is usually we have a simple question and we have a very complicated analysis and then hopefully sometimes we have a simple answer. It seems that you're leaving out of the middle in most cases. Is that why it's not? Well, yeah, it's difficult to please all the people all the time. So, yes, you just sort of give the one hand take with the other. Yeah, you need the detail, but you need the, 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 the chatty conversation as well. So, yes, we do a bit of both. <coughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, thanks a lot, Fernando, for the Amazon Institute. Um, I actually have a bit two questions. So the first one will be, um, I didn't understand if you are aiming uh, for general public for like absolutely everyone, like uh, my mother, um, Scientists also, of course, or like any type of person, or like it's more related to any kind of scientist or scientist in the, yeah, in the ecology or whatever. We, we sort of work on an idea of like an onion of concentric circles. So obviously our core audience uh, are you guys connected with, with Life Watch Eric, and then sort of broader scientific communities mm -hmm. you know, around the world, it's not just in Europe, obviously. And then beyond that, building out to more society and yes very general you know tell your mother please about the the um the magazines and the videos it's um, it's all very accessible or is it english at the moment you know um we've had this conversation before about really we should be doing podcasts in spanish you know 25 percent of the world really speaks spanish you know it's getting in touch with them <laughs> but uh, maybe you know but when, we're expanding, we're trying to expand and trying to satisfy everybody, which of course you never win, but we're getting some goals along the way. Thank you. Okay, sorry, it's the last presentation before lunch. Uh, I would like to introduce Christina uh, to the floor, and she will talk about uh, invasive species. Hi 
Hi everyone, uh, sorry it's me again. I was just supposed <laughs> to uh, give this talk and I'll try to be uh, brief. Uh, Ilana Rizzati, which is uh, one of my YouTube bosses, um, was supposed to give this presentation about one of the projects we are uh, working on, um, on the base of species. And uh, I'll try to, uh, it won't be as good as the previous, but, as the previous talk, but uh, I'll try to do my best. Okay, uh, so this is uh, the project. I'm gonna uh, um, um, introduce you uh, the context of the project, which uh, um, I, I'm aware most of you are already uh, already know uh, that uh, invasive animal species uh, uh, represent threats to biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, um, and they have negative impacts on human health and uh, to economies. And uh, uh, Italy, in particular, is one of the most invaded countries in Europe. Uh, it's estimated that more than 3,000 animal species uh, are present in our country, in our country, and 50 of which are considered invasive. And the overall economic cost uh, estimated between uh, 1990 and 2020 uh, is uh, over uh, 700 million uh, of euros. Uh, so it's very uh, big. Uh, but this study that estimated the cost uh, um, actually um, took into account only a few species uh, belonging to the first environments. So this cost might be even underestimated. Uh, thus, it's very important to uh, provide to policymakers and uh, uh, managers the real cost uh, of biological invasion uh, in order to, to take uh, uh, actions uh, uh, against this issue. So uh, the, aim, um, the aim of the project, whose acronym is uh, USAID, um, is to um, harmonize um, uh, monitoring strategies and uh, data management practice uh, in Italy. And this project uh, does involve um, a lot of uh, um, several research institutes within the National Research Council of Italy and, and involve uh, researchers from uh, working on marine and coastal <coughs> environments and on um, and uh, here in this graph, you see um, the main uh, aims of the different uh, work packages involved in the project. Um, one of the tasks uh, um, of uh, uh, the Group B2 uh, is to harmonize monitoring strategies and uh, data acquisition for invasive alien species. Um, the task of uh, um, Group 3 uh, in which we are more involved in, is to improve data management practices for invasive alien species. And, and then there, is a, there are several tasks involved in uh, the Group 4 um, uh, Basically, um, uh, the researchers in here are developing pilot study to test all the um, strategies that have been defined by the previous uh, um, uh, working group B2, group B2 and uh, group B3. And then there is another work package um, about market research and the use of uh, um, invasive alien species for commercial purposes. Now, going to, into details of each uh, group, um, the, the work package that uh, um, uh, uh, works on harmonizing monitoring strategies, started to um, um, uh, compile a survey, uh, which has been, uh, has been already um, uh, given to different researchers uh, of the National Research Council to collect information about uh, different management, uh, different monitoring strategies uh, used to monitor different species in Italy. Uh, there is going to be a workshop organized um, and with the collaboration of uh, uh, key uh, scientific experts on ES to define guidelines <coughs> for ES monitoring at the, nat at the national level. Of course, taking into account also uh, international and European monitoring strategies. The action two uh, is the one we are more involved in again, and it's about uh, harmonizing um, data management practices. Um, so we have already defined um, data management plans, um, which basically um, describe how all the data collected within the project and also other data outside the, pro the project 
will be managed and will be um, made available <coughs> for reuse according to the practices of fair and open science. And then there are different pilot studies uh, focusing on uh, different uh, key uh, invasive species in Italy. Um, and that have the aim to harmonize monitoring approaches uh, on different, um, uh, using different um, uh, type of data. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, we have uh, Ayano Saltissima. In this case, uh, um, uh, the monitoring is carried out by, by uh, remote sensing. Uh, but also, there will be stable hazard of analysis for the study of symbiotic relationship between Ayano uh, Saltissima and associated micrograzer. Um, and metagenomic uh, uh, data um, of bacterial and fungal communities uh, colonizing the root system. Uh, another kind of study is about uh, um, animal files, um, and uh, uh, the monitoring is uh, carried out by using uh, traps made with pheromones, uh, beating, and visual inspections, and also by monitoring the ex, uh, ex parasitoids. Um, and then um, uh, other kind of studies are focusing instead on uh, aquatic, aquatic invasive species, such as the Atlantic blue crab, and um, two species of Anadara, and uh, uh, two species of Cigarus. And uh, in this case, the monitoring uh, um, uses uh, uh, distribution, uh, collects uh, distribution and abundance data in the Arctic Sea and in the Pelagic, uh, Pelagic uh, Islands using the Arctic campaigns. And uh, there will be also some activities uh, um, tracking the movement patterns of the Atlantic blue crab uh, in nature and uh, in the lab using um, acoustic. Uh, finally, uh, there will be uh, some um, uh, market, market uh, analysis research strategies to understand uh, the nutritional um, uh, value of the species um, through uh, elemental, elemental fingerprinting and uh, metabolic analysis. And also, um, uh, a, um, the project will involve um, uh, restaurants and consumers to evaluate the appreciation of the invasive alien species when, uh, um, when they are used as, uh, as food for consumption. And uh, um, there will be um, uh, the quantitative spot analysis to evaluate the commercial use and also the uh, accounting for the risk reduction of uh, some of these species. And obviously, all this uh, data that will be collected and gathered within the project, but also external data, um, uh, being collected by the many researchers involved in the project would be uh, managed and shared uh, by using um, the LifeWatch uh, data portal and the data carbon. And so you will be here more about us, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. We have time for one more question. That separates us from lunch. <laughs> so who dares to ask one question? And if not, we are all hungry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would like to invite. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for the presentation. It was a very nice overview of different aspects on the threats of biodiversity. And I would like to ask you to take the opportunity of lunch to speak to some of them if you still have remaining questions or if you see opportunities for collaboration. Thanks all. Thank you.